A second chance. These are the words I think of when I'm playing World War II Zombies. A second chance, the zombies mode given to the team at Sledgehammer, after the flawed and naive experience that was Advanced Warfare Zombies. No doubt, World War II Zombies is widely considered the most hated out of the three non-Treyarch Zombies experiences, but what would it cause this infamous reputation? Is the game really as bad as everyone says it is? Well, hello there fellow zombie slayers, my name is Danley557, and this is my complete review of Sledgehammer's second attempt at the Call of Duty Zombies formula, World War II Zombies. So sit back, and relax as we explore the third entry in my non treyarch review series with World War II Zombies, a full circle finale. Before even jumping into the game, let's go over who developed this entry, as it feels important to the game's development and identity. Nazi Zombies began its run under the direction of Sledgehammer's own Michael Condre. Taking inspiration from Dead Space, a game he also helped to co-create, Condre set out to make a much more horrifying and cinematic experience than Call of Duty Zombies' previous entries. Condre aimed to take the co-op experience to new heights, and help further solidify the mode's status as one of Call of Duty's big three. This simple mission statement can be found all throughout the game's main three first experiences. The Final Reich, Ghost in House, and The Darkest Shore. With such a unique direction and commitment to storytelling, World War II Zombies has always had me intrigued, but I stayed away from the game after experiencing much initial disappointment with Infinite Warfare's IW Zombies, a game mode I still find very disappointing to this day. You can actually find those thoughts in the card above. And, after initially hearing about all the disappointment many fans experienced with World War II Zombies towards the end of its life cycle, I decided to leave the game alone, never to experience it for myself. Up until a year or two ago, that is. After completing IW Zombies, and AW Zombies, I just knew I had to complete this off-brand trilogy. So, here we are. Theming and direction aside, let's go over what sets World War II Zombies apart from other zombie outings. Undoubtedly, the game's most infamous feature is its armor system. For the cheap price of 500 jolts, players are able to equip themselves with Geist Child, or armor, the game's replacement for Juggernaug. Normally, the player is able to take three hits before downing. But, if armor is equipped, the player is thrown into a fatal blow, the armor will take the damage for the player and prevent them from dying. This can be done a total of three times. After the third piece is shattered, it will then become one hit away from death, with additional sets of armor being purchasable around various parts of the map for an increased price with each successive purchase. On the surface, this seems like an engaging buy, but oh boy, we'll get into the issues with the system later. Next up is the mod system. As players progress in levels throughout their playing experience, they'll earn Raven Tokens, a currency that can be exchanged for mods. Mods are special abilities the player can equip. These range from permanently active mods like increased reserved ammo, a permanent third weapon slot, extra abilities enhancements to a specialist mechanic, increased melee damage, an automatic set of armor at the beginning of the game, and so on. Right alongside mods are the specialist abilities. Unlike Treyarch's specialist abilities found in Black Ops 3 and 4, Sledgehammer opted to make the specialist mechanic an ability that changes the player's gameplay, rather than an infinite damage weapon that can be used for about 10 to 15 seconds. These abilities are a lot closer to how they work in Cold War. The abilities include Free Fire, Camouflage, Frontline, and Shell Shock. By simply pressing left and right bumpers simultaneously, the player is able to perform specialist abilities, like infinite ammo for Free Fire, invisibility for Camouflage, increased damage for Frontline, and area control with shell shock. In tandem with mods, these two systems truly allow players to customize their experience. Do you feel like being the team medic? Well, slap on some support mods and run shell shock or camouflage. 
Want to be the team's damage dealer? Well then, run Frontline or Free Fire with some damage mods. World War II Zombies is the closest the series has gotten to class-based gameplay, next to Extinction, a literal class-based co-op mode. The systems are quite nuanced and offer a ton of replayability. I typically ran Shell Shock with mods fully loaded, Pack Mule, and Sustain Zone. This allowed me to hold down areas with Shell Shock and Sustain Zone, maintain a consistent ammo supply with fully loaded, and keep essential weapons like the 9mm Sap, a point building weapon, and the Wonder Weapon on hand with Pack Mule. Never be afraid to try out new combinations and test out mod synergies, the game flourishes with its experimentation, and it's a shame how overlooked this feature is. And from player upgrades, let's take a look at our competition. World War II Zombies features four distinct zombie groups that accompany the player on their journey. The standard zombie, an enemy that starts out slow and picks up speed as the game goes on, always deals one hit point of damage to the player. These zombies will down you in three hits. The second enemy introduced is the Pest, a weaker but significantly faster enemy than its standard counterpart. Sporting no arms, the Pest deals slightly less damage than the standard zombie, and can down the player in four hits in rather than three. Then there's the Bomber Zombie, an enemy that switches between a slow hobble and a fast run. If the bomb detonates on the player, they'll experience two hit points of damage, but if the player has keen aim, they can kill the second head carrying the bomb and utilize the weapon to their own advantage to take out zombies with an explosive blast. If the bomb zombie becomes, well, bombless, he'll go into a dead sprint, and much like the pest zombie, deal light damage to the player that can down them in about four hits. And finally, there's the whistling, a much slower enemy that deals two hit points of damage to the player if they get too close to him. While much bulkier to head on attacks, the player can aggravate the whistling, causing him to dash at the player at full speed. And while dashing, the player has the opportunity to hit the whistling's weak spot, its spine. Whistlings are also the only zombie in the main four that don't count towards round completion, and will constantly patrol the play space and search for players, no matter where they travel to, unless defeated. With such a diverse cast, the gameplay never gets old. Okay, okay, that's not true, the gameplay definitely gets old, especially after the first map. Then there's the gameplay's storytelling. World War II offers a much more cinematic experience than its previous counterparts, sporting a prologue, a casual easter egg quest for the first map, and other cool oddities like the intel system. These are amazing additions to the world building of World War II Zombies. This allows new players to jump into the storyline if they so desire, and introduces them into a vast new world. It's honestly a feature I wish more games used. And finally, the game even sports a primitive version of Cold War's intel system. As you find radios and ciphers around the map, you'll be able to view them in the game's intel section. This is a great way to learn about the story and world building, without having to train zombies and listen to in-map radios. All of these systems reward dedicated players. This is definitely not just a mode you can just jump into, and much like a proper game, it requires the player to learn the systems inside and out to get the most use out of them. But now with all of that out of the way, let's get into the prologue, Grossed in House. And thus, we've arrived at Groston House, the Nocturne Totem of the World War II Zombies series. Cramped, small, and easy to learn, Groston House will teach the players the ins and outs of the game mode without holding their hand too much. So, what's the story? In the map's intro sequence, we are introduced to Hank Rideau, commanding officer of the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives program, a man dedicated to preserving the European history the Nazis aimed to destroy. Then there's the group he's assembled. Leading the charge is Marie Fisher, a member of the American Office of Strategic Services, who has been sent back to her hometown of Middleburg, a mining town taken over by the Nazis to investigate and retrieve the mysterious artifacts of war created by Dr. Peter Straub. Although not initially stated, her true intentions lie in rescuing her brother, Klaus Fischer, a man who has risked life and limb to leak sensitive information to the Americans. Next up is Drosten Hyde, a famously played by David Tennant, a former Scottish art thief who was given two choices, go to jail or join the group on their mission. Then there's Olivia Durant, a former historian turned French resistance fighter, and then there's American Army Captain Jefferson Potts. During the briefing, tensions are high, as it appears none of them were too ecstatic for the mission that they were chosen to do. But before an argument can break out, our group is attacked by a mysterious creature with her train derailing just short of the town. Being split from the rest of her group, Marie must traverse the countryside and make her way to the village to rendezvous with her team, encountering the horrors that await her along the way. The prologue is without a doubt my favorite tutorial we've ever seen in Zombies. Granted, its only competition is BO4s, and well, bo 4 tutorial is... Y you know. This is a zombie. You should kill it. The game does a fantastic job of teaching the players the ins and outs of the gameplay without breaking the immersion. The first object we encounter is a mysterious device that we can use to close the player's wounds and keep them alive during non-fatal encounters. 
The player is then tasked with grabbing a shovel and performing an execution on a zombie, a unique way to murder non-boss enemies. Executions leave the player in a lengthy animation, but can permanently one-shot standard and pest zombies. Performing this action also grants the player bonus points, or jolts as the game calls them, scavenge extra ammo, and scavenge additional lethal equipment. A really cool idea on paper, but on later maps I guess we'll talk about its execution. <laughs> And now the player has arrived at Groston House, where they learn about the game's remaining features. There's wall buys, doors, and perks, or blitzes as they call them, all of which are explained as being accessible by absorbing the jolts the player has harvested from killing the undead. Of course, there's also the armor station, and subsequent armor system. Purchasing armor allows players to survive three fatal blows, and the player is left with finally two objectives, purchase the door preceding them, or survive as long as possible. This opening act is without a doubt one of the reasons I'd recommend anyone who's into thematics and atmosphere to purchase World War II. Much like the Warden's monologue in Blood of the Dead, a level like this truly makes me believe a zombie's campaign could work, and Michael Condre and his team knocked it out of the park with their first impressions. Once you purchase the door, the game slowly fades to black as Marie finally reaches the town. The gameplay at Groston House would make any OG Zombies fan very happy. You've got no Pack-a-Punch, no Mystery Box, a few wall buys, Quick Revive, and an armor stand. This map is as bare bones as it gets, but much like the charm of classic zombies, it works to the map's advantage. The quick spawn rates and cramped corridors make for some exhilarating gameplay. Some things I also noticed were that the game doesn't spawn any power-ups during the prologue, so it truly feels like it's just you and the zombies. The map also shows off another of World War II zombies' unique traits, some of the slickest and most forgiving hitboxes in the series. Now, in Treyarch and IW zombies, if you tap a zombie by the hair on your arms, you're going to take the hit, whether you felt it was fair or not. World War II zombies, on the other hand, have without a doubt some of the most forgiving hitboxes and zombie attack speeds. Nearly every single play that you'll see in this gameplay could not have been done in any other zombies iteration. I can't understate how much this helped the gameplay of World War II. With the tight space and approaching enemy variety, this forgiveness was a must, especially for Gross and House. And while not required to escape the house, the game introduces you to your first specialist ability, Free Fire. Sporting a unique animation not seen anywhere else in the game, the player stabs themselves with a mysterious device and overcharges their weapon capabilities to spawn in infinite ammo. I think the explanation is that the device uses Geistcraft to create ammunition, but I really couldn't tell you. A cool addition to the map, though, is a hidden mystery box room. I accidentally did it while playing my game as I forgot how to, but if you shoot the 10 lanterns placed around the map, you'll unlock the mystery box. And if you obtain Jack in the Boxes and get his piano here 10,000 points, you can even unlock a pack a punch box, too. But without a doubt, the prologue is an experience every player who owns this game should try. Cinematic, a great tutorial, and a fun challenge, Grossen House is one of the best openings we've ever received in Zombies, because it actually treats the game mode like a proper story that should engage and teach players new and old. The town is just up ahead. I hope the others made it. Oh, and dear God, I hope Klaus is still alive. I'm coming, brother. Once you've completed the prologue and escaped the house, the game will end, with Marie now heading into the village. Once completed, the player will unlock Groston House as the survival map in the main menu. Omitting the opening sequence, Groston House survival throws you into the thick of it. Unlike the prologue where zombies begin to reach their top speed by round 20, marked by the introduction of a whistling, the survival map zombies reach their top speed as early as round 10, also marked by a whistling joining the horde. It's a legitimate challenge, with even a Brenner showing up in round 50, if you even make it that far. Fun fact. I, I, I didn't. To counter this rise in enemy opposition, players are also able to take with them their specific loadouts, which include mods, consumables, this game's version of Gobblegums and Elixirs, specific starting weapons, grenades, and specialist ability. The map also features the introduction and only appearance of the game's Wonderfist machine. For a simple 2,000 points, the game bestows one of the six perks on the player. So let's go over them real quick. Lieben Blitz, the game's version of Quick Revive, Laufen Blitz, Stamina Up, Faust Blitz, this game's version of Slappy Tappy and Ethereal Razor, Schnell Blitz, Speed Cola, and Shile Blitz, Electric Cherry, and Kugel Blitz, this game's version of Double Tap, without a doubt the most useful one of them all. And I'm also going to be referring to them by their standard names, like Speed Cola and Electric Cherry. While it's a short selection of perks, it gets the job done. And if you carry a mod that lets you carry an extra perk slot permanently, you can essentially carry every single useful perk in the game. Seriously, Electric Cherry in this game is without a doubt the worst rendition of the perk. Despite how short the variety is though, it gets the job done. And that's what I appreciate a bit more about World War II Zombies' perk selection compared to IW. If you play solo in IW, then your perk loadout will most likely consist of Jug, Speed Cola, Double Tap, Stamina Up, and Quick Revive. 
unless you're using Director's Cut, the other perks simply aren't much of an option outside of niche scenarios, like Bomb Stoppers only being useful in Spaceland. This same issue applies to a lot of Treyarch's pre-BO3 experiences. Unless the map has a feature to obtain more perk slots like Origins, you'll most likely be stick to the standard of 4. Honestly, the best example of a good perk selection is Mob of the Dead. Even though the map only features 5 perks, it's the one and only time the game omits Quick Revive from the map selection, and removes Mule Kick and Stamina for in favor of Jug, Double Tap, Speed Cola, and the player's choice of Electric Cherry or Deadshot. And for a map as complicated as Mob of the Dead, it makes it easy for the player to focus on their objectives, and doesn't fill the map to the brim with perk machines that don't really change the overall player experience. But I guess I'm in the minority here, because I know a lot of players really like more perk machines regardless, so what do I know? World War II Zombies streamlined the perk process in a way I wish we would see in Treyarch games. Instead of needing to buy Mule Kick and take up a precious perk slot, one of the mods does it for you. Want Bandolier Bandit? Well, another one's got you covered. Don't want to carry Quick Revive and Co-op? Well, use a mod slot that increases revive speed or camouflage. These are great ways to change the player's experience without overloading each map with a ton of perks you're never realistically going to use, like Deadshot on Call of the Dead and Moon, and Change Choose on Attack of the Radioactive Thing. Okay, seriously, who actually has purchased Change Choose as one of their main 5 perks without using Director's Cut on those maps? I'll wait. Yeah, that's what I thought. Mods are a great way to upgrade the player without taking up precious perk slots, and reward players for leveling up and unlocking new abilities. I feel like Cold War and Advanced Warfare have done this system the best though, with the ability to purchase all perks from the get-go, with Cold War actually paying attention to how each perk changes the gameplay, without a lot of overlap. And while this leads to less variety in perk choice, Zombies has always had an issue with perk variety, and I think it'd be unfair to only call out World War II Zombies for an issue I believe has persisted in Zombies since Ascension, when the first two new perks were introduced. But that's a video for another day, I suppose. Hot take perk rant aside, the Wonder Fizz machine in World War II has two major flaws. The machine has a massive cooldown timer to prevent repeated purchases, and you're locked into whatever perk the game bestows upon you. In a Treyarch game, players gamble their points for a random perk that'll always be cheaper than anything you can find on the map, but also gives the player the option to not take that perk if they so desire. So, for example, you could spend 1500 points and get Speed Cola for half the price, or end up spending 5,000 points for Juggernaug, a perk you can always just walk over to purchase for a quick 2,500. In World War II, you're locked into whatever the game gives you. Thankfully, you can cycle out perks by buying a new one, thus removing the one farthest in line for the newest one. It can take a while, especially with a machine's cooldown, but if you're willing to wait, you can easily end up with Double Tap, Quick Revive, Stamina Up, and Speed Cola. Unlike the prologue, the survival map reintroduces power-ups back into the fray, and if you get the box and Pack-a-Punch box easter egg going, it's a great time with friends. And, other than the armor station being moved to another room, that's all she wrote. Grosin House is a great introduction to World War II Zombies, and while it can feel like a minigame at times, I can assure you, this next map is a one-of-a-kind experience. But with all that out of the way, let's move on to our feature presentation, The Final Reich. And our story begins with The Final Reich, the second map in the World War II Zombies saga. Thankfully, because of the prologue, I don't have to do much to set the scene. So, let's get into The Final Reich, one of World War II Zombies' best maps. After approaching the town and rendezvousing with her team, our characters are tasked with infiltrating the bunker and finding the artifact, and hopefully, Klaus along the way. World War II Zombies wastes no time getting players introduced to the world with the casual easter egg quest and notebook system. Pivotal to the gameplay, atmosphere, and narrative, players are guided throughout the map's casual quest with a notebook system that directs players on what's their objective and where to go, much like a campaign mission. This is easily the map's best feature, and alongside the casual quest line, players are slowly introduced to each enemy type in isolated incidents, getting them familiar with their opponents before slowly throwing them all at you. It's a lot like how 9 introduces all 8 different enemy types to the player over the course of the first 15 rounds in mostly isolated scenarios before really letting loose and the true gameplay of the Chaos storyline is revealed. After activating the pilot light, players are thrown pests their way. Shortly after entering the salt mines, players are then given bomber zombies. And while collecting Geistcraft for the Tesla gun barrel, players are introduced to the whistling. And finally, upon collecting the second Tesla gun piece, players are then introduced to the Brenner. World War II's equivalent to the Panzer Soldat. Sporting a flamethrower and fire axe, the Brenner will hunt down players and deal, honestly, a pretty ineffective amount of damage with its flamethrower. Its primary purpose, though, is to present to players how fragile they are when they lose a piece of armor and how quick it is to lose subsequent pieces. Look at how fast that armor can dissipate. 
Once the Tesla gun is built, players must complete puzzles, defend objectives, and meet Colonel Richter, Straub's right-hand man. Sporting a powerful Zeppelin, players must attack the Flying Fortress and power the Hands of God. Once the Hands of God are powered, and players activate the Voice of God, the boss fight commences, where the encounter with the Panzer Mortar begins. The Panzer Mortar is honestly not that interesting of a boss fight. Its inclusion feels more like the developers just wanted to check off the box for Zombie Boss. It's also almost comical how similar Orta It from Cold War is to the Panzer Mortar. Almost like there was some idea sharing during the development of Cold War. The main objective is to dislodge three batteries from the Zeppelin, like in a much earlier step, and attach them to the Panzer Mortar. While pretty simple, and unengaging compared to other bosses like the Eye of Odin, Legion, and Ultimus Nikolai, it's a great first time fight to get players introduced to a boss level encounter, something previously only possible if you go through an entire difficult easter egg quest for an attempt at a fight. The final Reich's simple and easy to play easter egg makes repeated attempts a breeze, and is a great way to sharpen players' skills and introduce them to the world building of easter eggs. I think it's a great system that most games don't actually introduce anymore, and I think a casual easter egg quest is something that more games should implement. I really did enjoy how easy a lot of Cold War's easter eggs were. They introduced a lot of players to the world and allowed more people to do easter eggs. I do genuinely wish that Cold War had harder ones to ramp up the difficulty to allow players to keep improving their skills. This is what World War II and the Final Reich does great. You have a casual easter egg quest for a lot of noob time players, and the hardcore quest for people who really want a true challenge. After defeating the boss, players are rewarded with the outro cutscene. After attaching the third battery to the beast, the Panzer Mortar is pulled towards the Zeppelin, clawing the blimp's sides, blowing it up causing itself, Richter, and Klaus to perish in the explosion. Players are left with the defeated Marie as she stares at her brother's corpse. Players are then allowed to play the game to their heart's content. But what secrets lie within the map's hardcore quest? Well, let's get into them, shall we? A player can tell if they're on the right track by checking their notebook. The left side is marked and titled by various objectives, and all are about the casual easter egg quest, with the right side being unrequired. But if players want to complete the hardcore easter egg, both sides of the notebook must be filled up. The hardcore quest is where the map truly shines, and will test players' ability to multitask and stay level-headed. While completing steps for the casual easter egg, players should begin completing side objectives to obtain elemental batteries, fill up those elemental batteries with specific zombie requirements, collect the gramophone disc, and collect both sides of the coin to unlock the red talon. All of these tasks need to be done while players open numerous doors, unlock pack-a-punch, upgrade weapons, and still complete tasks for the casual easter egg quest too. It's a lot of fun once you know what to do, but the map has a steep learning curve, so I'd only recommend the hardcore quest to those who have already completed a lot of easter eggs and are familiar with the map. If you go into this map with the intention to learn and beat the egg on the first try, I think you'll be very disappointed. World War II Zombies demands a lot of time and dedication from the player. It feels like a proper game mode, and is the closest I've ever felt to Zombies becoming a true game that can stand on its own. But let's just say, if you're stupid and you attempt to beat all these easter eggs in solo like me, well, you better expect some failure. But if you can bring some friends along, World War II Zombies is definitely more co-op friendly than Solo. So, what are my thoughts on the hardcore easter egg then? I think it's the map's true main quest, that's why I breezed over the casual one. So let's talk about it. I think the hardcore easter egg quest is great. To an extent. The Final Reich has a pretty lengthy quest line, and a lot like Blood of the Dead, begins to overstay its welcome past the 2 hour mark. Inexperienced players will easily see runs go past 3 hours, and for experienced players, you'll still see runs that reach around 2 hours. It can be quite lengthy, and it doesn't help that nearly every single objective forcefully ends the round. Starting the clock tower defense will speed through rounds, beginning the second clock tower defense will speed through rounds, starting all 4 elemental upgrade batteries will end rounds, and on top of that, if any of these objectives fall on a pest round, then you'll be sure to hand you your max ammo and immediately jump to the next round. And finally, beginning the boss fight also ends the round. Unlike Sledgehammer's first endeavor though, Advanced Warfare, where I slammed the game for its insistent use of puzzles and a plethora of zombie steps, it's almost as if the developers traveled to the future, heard my criticism right now, and then completely overhauled their quest for the next game. In the early game, you'll have to do a bunch of running around and waiting to collect parts and get batteries set up, but once you've reached the mid-game and filled up the batteries, it's just zombie killing the rest of the way through. It's a lot of fun. The hardcore easter egg adds an intense flavor to the game, and the quest makes sure you've played around with every single zombie type. Almost to a fault. To fill up the batteries I've been talking so much about, players must get specific kills with certain traps. To fill up the Blood Raven battery, players must kill 5 pests with a single use of the spike trap. This must be done a total of 3 times in co-op and 2 times in solo. To fill up the Storm Raven battery, players must kill 2 whistlings with the Tesla Storm trap 2 times. To complete the Moon Raven trap, players must kill a horde of an upwards of 15 zombies with the S-Mine trap in the courtyard two times, and to fill up the Death Raven battery, players must kill two bombers with the Saw trap twice. 
What's nice is that the batteries actually begin to glow green once all the conditions have been met. This is a great indicator if you're not sure if you have the right amount of zombies, or if you're even at the right battery. I love a game that gives you direction and clues to point you in the right way. Finally, once you complete the lightning rod sequence, you can begin objective missions to defend the batteries while they charge. But, only one can be charged per round. Doing this will unlock an upgraded Tesla barrel and its upgraded Tesla upgrade. So, let's get into them, starting off with the base Tesla real quick. The base Tesla shoots out purple shots of electricity. Any zombie caught in its blast will be instantly stunned for a few seconds before being blown to bits. It's quite powerful, but takes way too long to activate. The weapon has the capability to one-shot the standard horde until round 18, so that's pretty cool. But past that round, the weapon may as well be a glorified stun baton. A silver lining, though, is that the Tesla gun has some stellar upgrades, so let's get into them, shall we? The Reaper. Firing yellow bolts of lightning, the weapon has the fastest projectile velocity and can swiftly eliminate small hordes of 10 to 15 zombies. After the initial shot, a random zombie will become consumed in a yellow energy and suicide bomb into its allies to cause further mayhem. A lot of fun, actually, but because only one zombie becomes turned, you might not even notice the effect. And if you fire a secondary cautionary shot, it'll instantly kill your turned ally. I didn't even realize the effect until I was playing around with the weapon for the footage of this video. Next up is arguably the worst, the Bloodthirst. Firing red electricity, the weapon shot can affect 10 to 15 zombies, leaving them stunned for a brief period, just like the regular base Tesla gun. But any enemy unfortunate enough to stand close to their frozen allies will soon succumb to a bloodstained explosion, killing all in the vicinity. The biggest issue with the weapon is its stun timer. By the time the zombies explode to the energy blast, most of the enemies will have dispersed from them. And much like the Reaper, many players might not even be aware of the weapon's effect and assume it's just a slightly upgraded version of the base Tesla. I originally thought it was. This weapon could have been easily fixed by a shorter fuse timer and a larger explosive radius. Next up is the Hurricane, the purple variant. This weapon fires out large electrical bolts, much like the Kamet's Bite in Origins. While having the slowest bolt velocity, players can use this to their advantage by walking with the orb, completely safe from all harm. The Hurricane is great at holding on choke points and utilizing the town's cramped and rigid map design. Finally, there's the Midnight, my personal favorite Tesla variant. Firing a storm of green blades, the Midnight quickly and efficiently murders nearly any zombie within its destructive range, much like the Hurricane. Utilizing straight corridors is the best way to abuse the weapon's raw power. Alright, final little nitpick real quick. Why isn't the Midnight called the Hurricane and the Hurricane the Midnight? One fires out a hurricane of blades, and the other one is purple like midnight. Yet alas, just the little things that annoy me, I suppose. While these wonder weapons are quite powerful, they require so much work to actually obtain, and are without a doubt the hardest elemental wonder weapons to make in zombies. And for a casual player, they simply aren't worth the effort, and for hardcore players, while they are powerful, they have an extremely low ammo count, and you'll have about two minutes of fun with them before they're already empty again. I'm all for late game content, believe me, but for how much work goes into these wonder weapons, I wouldn't blame anyone if they expected more. Honestly, a great comparison in terms of firepower and upgrade length are the exalted gauntlets from Ancient Evil, requiring a restored Flame of Apollo, specific catalyst kill requirements, and various challenge objectives, players are then granted the exalted gauntlets. While gaining only 10 additional ammunition, the gauntlets are extremely powerful and can vaporize entire hordes within seconds. And while the extra upgrade can just seem underwhelming because it only increases the ammunition, it's simply not required, and given to players who go the extra mile, the Tesla gun variants are just too convoluted for their own good, and you have to construct and complete all four for the hardcore easter egg. But this is only an issue if you're playing the hardcore quest line, so the issue can be easily avoided if you just want to build a Tesla gun variant or two, and then have some fun with that. Next up is the map design. The Final Reich features a wide variety of map design choices, large trainable circles in the village square, CQC areas in the bunker, and the tight straight lines found in the village, with many of them being connected in such a way to create map-wide circles and trains. This is extremely useful in the boss fight when the player is trying to avoid the Panzer Mortar. Moving on to the sewers, let's talk about the Pack-a-Punch process. Trapped in a steel cage, the Pack-a-Punch can be unlocked by sliding down three fast travel tubes around the map, each one slightly lifting the cage before finally freeing the Übersprägen. This is a great segue into how the map presents its horror, as it was a major design decision when making and marketing this game. For example, the designs of the zombies are amazing! The armless pest, the conjoined second head sewn onto the bomber, the horrific metal implants infused into the whistling, and its subsequent exposed spinal cord, these are without a doubt some of the best zombie renders we've ever seen. The game boasts stellar art design, and is easily some of the entire series' best work. I love the game's attention to detail and overall look. It easily elevates the experience to something truly special, but can also be missed by many players, and is an extremely underrated feature about World War II zombies in general. So let's talk about some of these moments and give them some exposure. I love the animation that plays when obtaining the Tesla gun parts.
Look at how each of the machines move. They all have their own unique animations and they all actually interact with parts in the environment. It's really cool. The fire that comes out of the Tesla gun buildable table when the Brenner first appears, the shaking of the town when you first arrive, the blinding light that appears when activating the hilt and the Geistcraft machine for the first time. the horrifying sounds that play when you activate the voice of God, a lightning strike when you successfully power the right hand of God, and the cutscene that plays when you encounter the Parents of Mortar. I love the shot when it reels itself back with the Zeppelin flying close behind. You'd be surprised how much moments like this resonate with me. It feels like the developers were taking this attempt very seriously, and unlike the co-op minigame feel of many of the game's past iterations, Sledgehammer were trying something completely different. That's why it's a shame only this map captures that feeling. And for as much as I like the map, there are a ton of moments that hurt the experience too. The biggest one being the jump scare system. While running around the map, the player has the chance to be jump scared by a random zombie in an attempt to scare the player, indicated by a loud sound effect and shaky camera. While they don't completely interrupt gameplay, for how mature and serious this game mode comes across, cheap attempts at horror like this really hurts the game's overall impression. I know that many players feel the same about this issue too. It doesn't help that these moments appear quite often throughout a normal playing experience, dampening the effect with each reoccurring instance. The system is best used to gain an extra zombie. My friend and I never went, ooh, ah, scary. We went, oh cool, extra points. For example, at the beginning of the match, the player has to turn pipes to activate the pilot light. While doing so, there's a chance the player can be jump scared by a random zombie or a set of crows at each and every single window. It doesn't scare me at all. I just go, Oh cool look, it's my people, they're birds. Another horror moment that doesn't really feel like a horror moment is the sewer attack. Each time the player attempts to lift the Pack-a-Punch cage in the game of the Final Reich, they'll have a chance to encounter the Blood Sewers event. Turning the room a deep red, the player is swarmed by, get this, a few pests. Really? That's it? Changing the hue and throwing a rather pathetic number of zombies at the player? It's a really awkward moment of style over substance. The game attempts to make the player feel uneasy and tense, afraid of what they've done. But when only met with by five pests, all fear immediately diminishes as the player has most likely already encountered a ton of pests throughout their game. This event should have locked players in the area temporarily with the Brenner, as the player would have already have encountered one when building the Tesla gun. This would have been a great way to reintroduce the enemy in a more difficult environment. It would actually scare players too, especially if they came alone. Speaking of terrible systems, let's go over the armor system and its controversy. As described earlier, the armor system protects players from three fatal hits. Without it, the player is roughly always on a three hit system. With armor though, the player's maximum health increases from three to six, with the six sequential hit downing the player. Now this sounds like a really good idea on paper. You're not always gonna be taking six consecutive hits, typically around three to four. This will only remove one piece of armor, leaving two more for continuous encounters later down the line. In theory, a player should only have to purchase armor once in the first 10 rounds, three to four times in the next 10 rounds, and by the mid twenties should be completely set up to maintain themselves till the end of the game. And while not the biggest issue specifically on the Final Reich, let's think of it like this. In every other Call of Duty since the beginning of time, Juggernaut and its equivalents grant the player a total of four survivable hits before fully downing the player on the fifth hit. Now imagine, instead of regenerating your health back to 250 once you survived a near-death experience, you no longer have Juggernaut and would have to repurchase the perk every single time at the Juggernaut machine for an increased price. That's the armor system. And of course, much like armor, once you go down, you'll have to repurchase Juggernaut anyways, so what's the issue? Well, in World War II, the price of armor can skyrocket to 10,000 points per purchase. So now, let's put you in a scenario I encountered with my friends when we did the Final Arc Easter Egg recently. Players that aren't as experienced in the game will continue to purchase armor because they can barely survive with it. What makes them think that they'll survive without it? It got to the point where in the boss fight, I was just dumping my massive sum of points on the ground for them to pick up so they could even afford one set of armor. Oh, by the way, you can press left on the D-pad to drop points to other players and complete objectives. A seriously underrated feature of the game that every single Zombies game should have. Seriously, you're telling me that Cold War has this entire wheel for stupid emotes and not a single one of them is dedicated to share money and a co-op experience? Right, armor. 
The system is extremely flawed, as it's designed under the impression that all players are always thinking about ways to escape the zombie horde with minimal casualties, and they're not playing very risky. And for a lot of players, and for the scenarios in World War II's questline, this doesn't work. It ruins the whole casual experience the map is trying to offer, because the system expects a lot from players who are just trying to play a casual game of zombies, and it entraps inexperienced players into the Jug scenario. Let me describe the Juggernaut scenario like this. As someone who had an issue when I was first playing zombies, if a player is constantly going down, they'll begin to play under the impression that they can barely survive with Jug, and surviving without it now is out of the question, despite the fact that a better weapon, or even a pack-a-punch one, will help them back on their feet in the long run. Armor entraps players into the exact same scenario with an ever-increasing price tag. It's not the game's fault that the player has to keep buying armor, but that doesn't change how flawed the system is in comparison to the simple purchase of Jug, a perk that gives the player much more bang for their buck. The armor system is a unique idea, but it's extremely flawed, and the system would have worked better if the price capped at 5000 or even 2500 to mirror Jug. Another idea I would have is that maybe armor could be tied to whatever round it is, so that by the time you reach round 30, armor then skyrockets to 10,000, but in the first 20 or so rounds, armor at maximum only stays at 2,500, as it's able to help inexperienced players in the early rounds, and then starts actually providing a real challenge to experienced players in the higher rounds. And finally, let's talk about the characters. Sadly, a lot like AW, and despite the game's very cinematic opening, our characters play a very tertiary role in the map standard dialogue. A lot like AW, our World War II crew has a very limited quote pool, and before you know it, you'll have already heard every possible quote to the point where many of the quotes used for the pest, bombers, and whistling are reused in every single map going forward. It's a real shame. For all the writing the game does, our main crew, the people players will be playing as the most, get very little in terms of varying lines. And honestly, aside from David Tennant as Drosten, the voice acting is pretty shoddy, especially from Marine Dr. Straub. I can't tell if it's her Austrian accent, but Marie has an extremely awkward way of speaking, especially when you compare her accent between cutscenes. Like, look at the game's prologue, she says Straub correctly here, but in the Darkest Shores outro cutscene, she pronounces it as Strobe. He provides the location of a hidden bunker, where Dr. Straub and Colonel Richter have been collecting some peculiar people. Straub! He's escaping! And in the prologue cutscene, her line delivery is extremely awkward. It's like the actress forgot and remembered she was supposed to sound Austrian halfway through her line. Listen right here. Ten days ago, we received a dossier. Material smuggled out by a young Austrian scientist who's reconsidering his loyalties. In it, he provides the location of a hidden bunker. Half the time, she sounds completely American, and the other half of the time, she sounds Austrian. Dr. Straub faces a very similar issue, primarily with how he speaks, though. At times, his words are almost unintelligible. Thank goodness the subtitles are here to pick up the slack. So, I drew my pistol. I unloaded my entire weapon into the thing. Only after I had torn a significant hole through its spine, did this untoter drop to the ground. And then, I saw the second one lurching toward me, with its intestines spilling down one. Especially in the Shadow Throne, where the echoes and the loudspeakers make it impossible to hear what he's actually saying, and it makes it sound like he has a massive lisp. And before we end off our review, let's go over the map's epilogue, only accessible from completing the hardcore easter egg. After obtaining the Hilt's gem, the Ribbon Hers, and completing the hardcore boss fight, players bring back the deceased Klaus. Despite her best wishes, Klaus ignores his sister, and warns her and her team of the dangers ahead. While players escort Klaus around the town, they are granted infinite ammo from the Geistcraft emitting off his body. This section throws an unending horde of the undead at players, but because of the infinite ammo, players can simply spam the Tesla gun variants to their heart's content, easily defeating the undead masses. And this isn't your standard infinite ammo where you have to reload the clip because you have infinite reserve. No, no, no. With this game's infinite ammo, you never have to reload, leading to moments like this with my friends. Absolute chaos. Finally, the epilogue ends with Klaus driving himself onto the pilot light that started this adventure, and succumbs to the burning flames, leaving behind a haunting message. Besides Derizendrock's moon destruction and Grog Krovi's Dr. Monty's monologue, no other map has offered an epilogue of sorts, and especially for how thematically fantastical the map is, the epilogue fits in perfectly. It's another one of the map's standout moments, and it's a pretty good ending. 
although it could use a Brenner or two to really spice things up. Fun fact, apparently the hilt can increase revive speed, so that's pretty neat, and it makes sense considering that the weapon brought Klaus back to life too. But with all that said, that's the final Reich, easily one of World War II Zombies' best outings. From its fantastic introduction and plotline to a finale that feels epic and lived in, it's a great map for hardcore and casual players, and despite some of its gameplay flaws, accomplishes everything that it set out to do. It's clear to see why the Final Reich is one of the game's most well-received maps. So, how does it follow up this great foundation in the upcoming maps? Well, let's find out. Alright, the next map on our list is The Darkest Shore, typically considered one of the game's worst round-based maps. But of course, with my wacky sense of map choice, let me explain why I actually really enjoyed The Darkest Shore. It's not as bad as you think. Our story begins following the events of the Final Reich. Our group hunts down Dr. Straub to the Northern Sea on the island of Helgoland, a sea fortress filled to the brim with the Nazi army's Kriegsmarine. In the final hours of the war, their mission is simple, locate and capture Dr. Straub before he sets his plans into motion. While arriving at the island, our crew is ambushed by the undead horde, and their convoy is destroyed, leaving only our heroes to face the undead horrors alone. The Darkest Shore begins with the beachside ambush, and a direct homage to Land of the Dead, being our first and only ever Round Zero in Zombies. The Beach Rush is a quick objective that invites us to the island and the horrors that await us along the way. This Round Zero is perfect, and was just what maps like Ancient Evil or even Nine could have greatly benefited from, a full arena's worth of zombies getting players thrusted right into the action. Unlike the Final Reich, the Darkest Shore and subsequent maps don't offer the notebook system and casual quest line. It's a shame. Experiences like that are a great way to introduce less experienced players to the Easter Egg world, and it made the prologue and the Final Reich feel much more like campaign missions, something most fans have been asking for for years. Moving on from the opening storyline, there's the map's design and aesthetic. Unlike the Final Reich, this map fails to provide the same grandiose atmosphere, and unlike the mysterious and eerie vibe found in Middleburg, Helgoland provides a frigid and desolate wasteland that sadly isn't as inviting as Condre and his team hoped it would be. The map's color palette is also the worst of its kind. Taking a page out of AW's Infection, the Darkest Shore is filled to the brim with some of the series' bleakest grays, greens, and browns. It is without a doubt the map's most infamous feature, and severely hurts the map's overall feel and first impression. The map doesn't have to look star-studded with bright pastel blues and pinks, but let's take a look at Voyage of Despair, a bleak, desolate ship filled to the brim with color and the magical wonder of the Titanic, or even IW's Beast from Beyond, which takes place within an abandoned cryptid facility. Even if you decide to ignore the theater, the base is brimming with color and personality, indicating that people were realistically working there. You know, I really didn't go into this review thinking I'd relate something to Beast from Beyond, but here we are, I suppose. From the cafeteria, spawn room, cargo bay, infirmary, central command, and the outside, Beast is brimming with varied locations and room set pieces. If you look at the darkest shore, it's hard to believe that people actually worked here. The place looks like an actual outhouse. It's disgusting. A big issue with the Darkest Shore's level design is that most of the level looks very similar, and areas like the airfield off the distance would have been a great change of pace to the layout. It's a shame, especially considering you can see it right off in the distance by the mountain too. The map is quite small, with a ton of overarching pathways and an honestly unneeded fast travel system. A full trip around the map can be made in just about a little under a minute. But size isn't everything. What does the map have to actually offer? Coming in first, we have the Ripsaw, this map's wonder weapon. Taking advantage of the game's melee slot, the player can press right on the D-pad to activate their respective melee weapon's unique ability. The Shovel's special ability is the Execution Maneuver. By pulling out the Ripsaw, running, and pressing the Run button again, players will go into a bayonet charge. While in this motion, players can rush into a zombie to perform a brutal execution. And by pressing the X button while executing your undead foe, the player is able to harvest a spine and the subsequent charge spines. I literally can't tell you what charge spines do outside of their respective easter egg purposes though. Other than the bomber zombie, every zombie type has a harvestable spine, and by using those Geistcraft empowered spines, players are now able to upgrade the Ripsaw to obtain the launchable blades. While not very effective at killing the undead horde, it's extremely useful for the egg. But if it's only useful for the map's quest, does that make it a useful weapon or just a gimmick? We'll get back to that topic later in the Shadow Throne. 
Simply combining the stock from the previous Tesla gun and the saw blades used by Dr. Straub, our team forges the unlikely weapon. Apparently, Jefferson brought with him the Tesla guns they acquired from the previous map, but many were destroyed in a storm along the way. What a neat little bit of lore. I will say though, trying to obtain a charge spine from a zombie can be brutal. One time, I charged into 20 zombies and didn't obtain a single charge spine. Stuff's whack. I must say though, how easy it is to build and upgrade this weapon in the first place. The steps aren't too difficult either. I figured it out on my first attempt on the map with very little health. It's an extremely satisfying little quest that doesn't demand too much of the player. The map is honestly pretty beginner friendly in the setup department. Steps aren't too hard to figure out, and grabbing parts for the ripsaw are typically placed in areas where the player's eyes would be drawn. For example, when reaching the top of the mountain, players' eyes will be directed towards a sparkling saw blade just lying at the top of the steps, right in their eye line. I will say, it's a lot less nuanced than the Shadow Throne. And then there's the weapon's upgrade, the Ripsaw. After following a complicated upgrade process, the player can pack a punch the Ripsaw, sporting more powerful blades, the weapon now boasts greater killing potential, rather than just being a gimmick for the easter egg. But this begs the question then, why not just allow players to pack a bunch of weapon in the first place? Why lock this upgrade behind a convoluted side quest? Many players will simply leave the Ripsaw in their inventory and forget it's the map's main wonder weapon. Sure, it provides a cool little upgrade for those willing to look for it, but seriously, raise your hand if you can remember the last time you upgraded the Ripsaw. Okay, much less play the Darkest Shore. But by doing this, you've locked the weapon's upgrade behind a side quest most won't even bother to complete. But sure, let's say you figured out how to upgrade it. Is it worth all the effort? Okay, enough with the thematics, the answer is no. The RIP saw is simply an okay wonder weapon. Honestly, the upgraded version feels more like what the base version should be doing. Underwhelming is probably the best term I use for it. I feel the weapon would have greatly benefited from a wider saw blade that could rip through more zombies than just those standing directly in front of the player in a straight orderly line. And it would probably accommodate the wider level design of World War II. Next up are the fog rounds and the map's subsequent new enemy. If you ever thought fog was bad in Origins and Call of the Dead, just wait till you get to the fog in the darkest shore. Starting at round 3 and then appearing every couple of rounds afterward, the game throws at you the fog. Spawning in more of the undead and lowering your visibility to almost nothing, the game attempts to blind the player and make it more difficult to traverse the map. While in the fog though, zombies will become blinded too, and unable to easily detect the player unless they get too close or fire off their weapon. A very interesting design choice, I must say. Starting at around round 8, the fog also brings with it the game's newest enemy, the Meuchler, apparently German for assassin. Agile, powerful, and tanky, the Meuchlers are Deem Straub's ultimate killing machine, and he has unleashed them on the island in the hopes of finally taking down the player for good. Meuchlers will only spawn in during fog rounds, so if you notice incoming fog, I'd highly recommend bunkering down in the U-boat room, as it's one of the few places not defiled by the fog and also the best way to prepare for the incoming Moichler's attacks. Because, oh boy, an event that makes most of the map unplayable? I wonder where I've heard that mechanic before. But if you're trapped in the fog, prepare to be attacked. The Moichlers are some of the game's most powerful enemies, doing nearly three hit points of damage in one hit, nearly taking away one piece of armor with ease. It's usually easy to tell if a Moichler's preparing to attack the player by listening out for their unique cries. They are also one of the few enemies to outrun the player without stamina up, so if you haven't picked it up yet, you better prepare to bunker down. These are some of the few zombies to also have a sense of self-preservation, much like Ultimus Richthofen in the Victus comics. Once they've sustained enough damage, the Moichler will attempt to escape, and leave for a brief intermission before reappearing. Don't worry though, with frontline and a powerful weapon, Moichlers can be easily dealt with. Look at these quirky little characters die. Yeah, who's got the firepower now? The Moichler's cat and mouse gameplay style makes them a top tier threat and are some of the only boss level enemies next to the Origins Panzer that truly strikes fear into the player. It accomplishes exactly what the developers intended it to do. These enemies do ruin the Darkest Shore's casual invitation though. I can imagine many players getting frustrated at how difficult the enemy is to fight. It contradicts how well the early game was developed and curated for casual players. And then there's the minecart system. Switching between three different locations, the minecart can take the player around the map, and along the adventure, the player can obtain fuses that must be used to open Pack-a-Punch. And before we move on to the main quest, let's talk about some nitpicks, shall we? I really hate that we no longer get introduced to each and enemy type over time like in the Final Reich. It was a really cool way to slowly ramp up the action. It's funny how the fish flopping and spawn aren't actually the fish lying on the beach. Instead, they use a separate set of fish that jump through the terrain and their brethren to imitate the illusion of them all flopping. And then there was this funny glitch that happened with a zombie. Look at this poor little character. 
And finally, the map can feel extremely bland and hollow if you're not setting up for the Easter egg. I can understand how someone who isn't absolutely insane like me can feel underwhelmed at many of the map's unique qualities, as most of what makes this map stand out is locked behind the egg. And by the time you made it to round 15, there's not really a whole lot left to do, especially from a solo player's point of view. Alright, let's get into that main quest, shall we? What, in my opinion, elevates this map from an okay to a great. The easter egg starts with players making and upgrading the ripsaw, opening the map, and unlocking Pack-a-Punch. Once you've obtained the severed head on the mountain archway and powered the corpse gate, the U-boat lockdown begins where the easter egg starts. Spewing fire from the floors, a zombie onslaught from all sides, and the cackling Dr. Straub from above, this is one of the map's best moments. Players have to navigate the tight space while avoiding the flames and preparing to turn the valves around the play space to save themselves from a fiery grave. Just like the lightning rod step from the final Reich, players do have to be mindful of their current round and how easy it is to push them while completing the objective. Once all three valves have been activated, the corpse gate will be opened in one of the gnarliest moments ever in Zombies. If you're a bit squeamish, I'd highly suggest that you look away. It's brutal. Now, with the corpse gate open, the flat cannons on the top of the mountain will become powered and operational. I love the corpse gate lockdown. It's difficult, stressful, and doesn't exactly hold the player's hand. It separates the experienced players from the inexperienced ones. And with how difficult this map's boss fight is, I think it's for the best. Now, a German air fleet will begin to bombard the map. Dr. Straub laughs at our character's lateness as he begins to make preparations for his army to escape. The Stukas, or the planes, will begin to attack any living players on the outside areas of the map. And believe me, they will destroy you, armor and all. Thankfully though, the characters will make comments about where the Stukas are coming from to make it easier to avoid them. But honestly, I have literally no idea how to make heads or tails of their directions or comments. The player can rush over to any of the numerous flat cannons that rest on the top of the mountains and shoot down the enemy planes. Thankfully, while using the guns, players are able to avoid all damage, kill any incoming planes and zombies, and once you're ready to leave, the guns shoot out a burst of Geistcraft, temporarily stunning any zombies in the nearby vicinity, allowing players to escape. This is perfect! For once, a rideable weapon with a sensible backup protocol so players can actually use them and not die. Like, look at the corruption engines for 2,000 points on Revelations. While destructive, I can definitely remember a time or two where a zombie appeared behind me from the teleporter from Noct, and I wasn't able to spin around fast enough to take them out. And while the flat cans have a health bar so you can't stay there forever, it's extremely generous, and even slightly shooting above the zombie's heads is enough to prevent further damage. What's even better is that you can roughly aim in the correct area, and each bullet will take out those planes with ease. They have very generous hitboxes, and overall makes this an amazing step. Once all the planes have been shot down, players are not able to branch off and do whatever they want to do next. Want to get involved in spine collecting? Well, grab this monk head from the sealed chamber and get started. Want to play a game of battleship with Straub's forces? Go for it! Just like the Final Reich, the player can multitask and work towards multiple steps at the same time. But unlike the Final Reich, the player has a lot more freedom and choice in their actions. Unlike many Atreyarch Easter eggs, which follow linear paths and storylines, with one of the very few exceptions being Dead of the Night. Taking the left side of the board first, players must activate the bomber escort found within the corpse gate and grab various radio parts. Upon delivering the bomb safely and activating the radio, players can start the battleship minigame. Aiming and raising the elevation of the cannon, players are able to launch artillery shells at the enemy boats. And if you miss them, Marie and her allies will be sure to push you in the right direction. Watch out! Aim lower! This is a great way to direct players on what to do, without completely telling them the answer or leaving them in the dark. Once the boats have been destroyed, you'll have completed the step. And apparently, if you shoot down both ships on your first two bullets, you'll even complete a secret challenge, which I somehow did accidentally without a guide. Huh, neato. Then there's the right side of the board. The player has to go around the map and collect various children of Nerthus, the Germanic god of fertility. Once all three have been returned to the hidden door, players are able to access the hidden ritual chamber, where they can choose to fight the three praying moichulers or run away like a sensible person. Seriously, you just can't fight them off fast enough. Granted, as soon as you leave, you can begin to harass them with your ripsaw and bayonet charge to knock them over and collect an easy moichular spine. 
taking the spine to the monk, players are able to begin a game of Marco Polo with a Moichler while he is hunted down by his brothers. This is an extremely unique step, and it's not that bad once you know most of his locations, using his screams as indicators if you're getting close to him or not. Listen to this sound. One time, I even caught him hiding before the fog had even fully shrouded him. Look at this goober. The map will also be shrouded in perpetual fog until the step is either completed or failed, so make sure you know your Moichler hiding spots. Fun fact, the screams used during this step is the exact same one used by the Brenner in the Final Reich, where he first spawns in. Once completed, the player can challenge the empowered Moichler in a heated ritual battle that can be easily completed if you just use Frontline. Watch this demon fall. The next challenge you can complete is the Whistling Escort. What a step! Players have to defend the whistling while you lead him around the map as he collects a specific series of perks. And let me say, this step is infuriating in solo. Going forward, none of the steps in World War II were really designed with solo players in mind, so just keep that thought in your head while we continue to talk about the rest of the game, as I continue to handicap myself and make these runs harder than they have to be. To prevent the whistling from collecting the wrong perk, players do have to shoot him as he approaches the perk machine. And let me say, if you've brought him to the wrong perk, this stupid hunk of metal will attempt to grab the perk by any means necessary. What's really cool is that once the whistling has collected stamina up, he will actually begin to pick up speed and follow the player at a much faster rate. Once the whistling has collected quick revive and entered the wall, a second battle will commence with another anointed head being granted to the player. And finally, there's the pest step. Oh boy. The pest step requires players to align rebounded ripsaw shots off of these colored panels around the map. And if you're trying to do this in solo, then may God have mercy on your soul. Trying to align these shots in solo is pretty infuriating. You'll without a doubt be required to look up a guide on how to fire these shots correctly. Thankfully, the COD Zombies Reddit actually has great guides on how to beat these steps and what to do, with quick video and visual tutorials too. I know, a subreddit that's actually useful? Rocket science. Give them a shot if you're stuck on a step. It beats trying to learn from Noah Gay 456 over there, I'll tell you that. Most of the shots aren't too bad, but this one by the bunker had me infuriated. Thankfully, this game does not boast the 5 minute zombie timer that plagued almost every single one of my AW Easter Egg runs. My first time doing the egg, my pest just literally gave up and died. Thankfully, once you've aligned all the shots, you can head back to the ritual room and acquire the third anointed head. Now, what I absolutely adore about this egg was the unique interactions with each of Straub's creations and the Monkhead, with the Monkhead actually giving you clues and riddles on how to solve each of the steps of the right side of the Easter egg. <laughs> Behind the door, the mother waits for three lost sons past yonder gates. The first Red and buried low, and second drowned, but the final lad, gone still with loss, breathed in mist, a full plate in It brings damnation! Save him from his jealous brethren. He even gives each allied monstrosity its own introduction. It really helps to make the world of World War II zombies feel a bit more lived in, and builds up the scenarios and creations encountered in the first map. I love that each turned ally has their own role to play, each with their own unique set of animations, coding, and special events. For example, one of the zombies you spawn in using a regular zombie spine will make its way to the beach before entering the waters and returning with the sun on Nerthus. What a cool idea! 
almost like a sacrificial act before bringing you what you couldn't find. Moments like that and more are what really elevate this map in my opinion, but because many of these key moments are locked behind the egg, the map can feel very shallow and empty. It's truly one of World War II's greatest weaknesses, a lot like what plagues Black Ops 4, both games aiming to elevate the zombie experience to new heights. Both extremely ambitious projects that put story and memorable moments above all else, factors that can really hurt a game mode most well known for its easy to pick up and play approach. But that's a video for another day, I suppose. Once the third head has been collected, the player can grab the monk head and place them atop the final hook. Once done, players must now fill the ritual pool with blood. Much like another Sledgehammer Zombies adventure, where players have to fill a pool with the blood of their enemies, but I can't quite recall what game that was. Perhaps there was an amazing hour and a half review to go alongside it too. But I guess we'll never know. Once the pool has been filled, the player can now collect the pommel of Barbarossa's sword. Unlike the hilt, the pommel can actually be used as a weapon. Taking up the tactical slot, the pommel, when thrown, will unleash a devastating blast that can kill any zombie in its range. And much like the bloodthirst on the final Reich, after a small period of time, it'll unleash a deadly blast killing any extra zombies unfortunate enough to remain in its range. Sadly, the weapon just isn't as effective as you might lead you to believe. The range is quite pitiful, and much like the bloodthirst, the timer to explode is simply too long, and most enemies will have escaped its range in that time. But finally, we can talk about the boss fight, easily one of the most difficult and satisfying boss fights next to the pre-patched Legion and Mephistopheles. After throwing the pommel at the radio, our characters call in backup, with the explicit intent to blow up the island with them still on it, sacrificing themselves in the hopes of destroying Straub's army. But while doing so, are ambushed by some of Straub's most powerful creations, the Meister Meuchlers, or simply put, Royal Assassins. The Meister Meuchlers come in four different varieties, each based off a different raven power and specialist ability. On the first wave at the beach, players will be ambushed by a single Meister Meuchler at a time. The purple Master Meuchler buffs his allies, causing them to deal increased damage with increased health. Blinding the player in a flash, there's the green Master Meuchler, who attempts to destroy the player's gaze and make himself invisible. Shooting out saw blades, the yellow Master Meuchler is a force to be reckoned with, dealing easily over 3 hit points of damage. It's highly recommended players prioritize him first. Then there's the red Master Meuchler. Discharging a red energy, much like the Cell Shock ability, the Red Master Meuchler will use your stunning techniques against you and send you back in disorienting your position. It's so cool how the game flips your abilities on its head and uses them against you, all while retaining the difficult qualities that make the Meuchlers a threat in the first place. The boss fight is one of the game's best, being both difficult and tense, with the player needing to use Jack in the Boxes, their specialist, and smart thinking to make it out alive. What's even cooler is that if you take too long, the phase will end prematurely, and the bombing on the island will actually begin. What a cool set piece! It truly encapsulates the essence of a grand finale. You can tell the game was directed by someone who really knows what they're doing. Taking the minecart to the next phase, the player is thrown a Brenner their way. Taking him down for good, players now have to survive the Moichler onslaught while attempting to avoid the fires from below. This is also where the game throws two Moichlers at you at the same time. Trust me, the Ripsaw is your best friend during this step. Using it to knock one of the Moichlers is critical in taking down the second one chasing you, especially in solo. You're also most likely to go down during this phase, and it is without a doubt the hardest part of the boss fight, especially because there's no way to refill your armor between phases 1 and 2. And trust me, the lack of armor in phase 2 severely increases this fight's difficulty, and it goes from challenging but fair to absolutely insane. Again, the same issue persists that I talked about earlier. Without a reasonable way to restore armor, the player is left to fend for themselves with only 3 hits, and I really can't express how much fun it is to always be one hit away from death with an enemy that can almost one-shot me. But if you somehow manage to survive, you'll have entered the home stretch. The third phase takes place on the entire top of the mountain. Players now also have access to an armor stand, making this part of the fight substantially easier than the previous, even if the fog makes it nearly impossible to see your incoming adversaries. Trust me, just train them around the bunker, that's all you have to do. Finally, when enough damage has been dealt, you'll be able to ride the minecart for one final battle on the beach. In a great cinematic moment, the map begins where it ends, with all four Moichlers, no longer shouted by the fog they so dearly crave, coming out at you together to defeat you once and for all, in an epic battle to the death. Or you can just use Frontline and murder them like I did. With the boss fight completed, we get rewarded with one of the game's best looking cutscenes. With the ambush defeated, our characters make a run for Straub Zeppelins, making it in the nick of time. Our characters escape the destruction of Helgoland and Straub's zombie factory. Our characters realize they're heading to Berlin, where Straub is coming home to rescue the Nazi army and stop the Russian advance on the city. 
where the war in the European theater is in its final hours. The Darkest Shore ends with an absolute bang, the writers and animators doing a great job at escalating the story, and much like Drives and Jock before it, actually sets an engaging plot into motion. The finale is easily what elevates this map from a subpar experience to one of the series most epic, but I can understand how many players will simply find the map underwhelming. And I do agree, the developers should have put more time into making a map filled for all with traps, more locations, mechanics, and ideas, rather than a niche cinematic experience only idiots like me will enjoy. But that's the Darkest Shore, such an underrated gem in the World War II catalog. But sadly, unlike the Final Reich, the map is missing that little push that takes it from good to one of the greats. Thankfully though, the Easter Egg is more than willing to pull its own weight. The Darkest Shore was an absolute blast to play, and if you're a fan of the Final Reich, the Darkest Shore does not disappoint. So how does the story unfold in the Nazi motherland? Well, let's find out. Next up on our adventure is the Shadowed Throne, the third map in the World War II Zombies saga. Taking place in the heart of Berlin, the story follows our heroes and their attempts to stop Dr. Straub once and for all before he uses his undead army to turn the tides of the waning world war. First and foremost, let's get into the map's theming and overall aesthetic. Unlike the Darkest Shore, which featured a gloomy and desolate atmosphere, the ruined and burning city of Berlin, the zeppelins that filled the sky, and the dangerous and fragile state of the area make for some of the game's best theming. The biggest issue with the map's art design is that it's quite often related to Garag Krovi, another ruined, burning city, filled to the brim with robots and machines alike, with the only exception being the lack of dragons, of course. This similarity hurts the map's identity, as it's quite often called the Lesser Gorod Krovi, and with the release of Mauritor Toten, the Lesser Mauritor Toten. But honestly, while playing the map, I never particularly got any of those vibes. The Shadow Throne did a great job to help stand itself out from the competition, with the cramped musical theater, the lively museum with an exhibit on the human anatomy, and the camp within the church. All of these places make for excellent set pieces, and other than the apartment building, they all help make the map stand out much more than Mauro Toten's interpretation of a city, which honestly just feels more like any other town set in the 80s, with the most interesting location being the DMZ, a set piece unique to Berlin at the time. Some of my favorite little tidbits about the map are all the little ruins of Straub's handiwork lying in the streets. In the main square, players will find empty weapon caches, and in the theater, there will even be empty perk machines, not set to any specific perk yet, emanating a faint white glow. Activating a nearby trap turns the broken machines on, and electrical sparks begin to fly, electrocuting any zombie in the vicinity. Now, are these traps useful? Definitely not. And besides a trap or two in the upcoming maps, these methods of zombie killing aren't really used anymore. Alright, so while getting footage for the Wonder Weapon, I realized I'd hardly ever use the weapon in combat, and my analysis barely goes into the weapon's strengths and weaknesses. So, allow me to redo this section that you people won't even see the first part of, so let's talk about the Wonder Bus. Apparently a stolen prototype of Colonel Richter's from the Final Reich, the weapon can be forged using a Geist Bolt collected from meleeing the map's newest enemy, the Gagok, otherwise known as the Sizzler, and collecting an energized battery. The Wonder Weapon itself is actually pretty okay in combat. Firing a concentrated beam of Geist Craft, the weapon fares decently well in battle, but after about 5 seconds it needs to be recharged. To recharge the weapon's Geistcraft energy, players need to fire Geist Harpoons using the left trigger, with each harpoon siphoning energy from the zombies to the weapon. The only other way players can refill the weapon is by performing executions, with salvaged ammo granting the weapon 75% of its ammunition back. Honestly, a lot more effective than just using the harpoons. In tandem with this knowledge, the weapon can be used a lot more than I originally gave her credit for. The weapon's biggest weakness, however, is its 5 seconds of fun mentality. After quite literally 5 to 10 seconds of firing at a full horde, the weapon has already run out of ammo and the time consuming process of a harpoon siphoning must begin again for the player to even use it. Or you can just do what I do and choose the execution roulette. And this weapon has easily the worst zombie to ammo ratio of any wonder weapon yet. 
For example, think about how much longevity the player can get from wonder weapons like the Thunder Gun or the Apothecan Servant, with one shot being more than enough to take out an entire horde, and the player has upwards of 12 plus shots in the Thunder Gun and 9 plus shots in the Apothecan Servant. Or what about other weapons like the Kraken or the Ray Gun? Even though it takes quite a few shots to take out an entire horde, the player is given more than enough ammo to compensate, making each of these weapons wonderful. Or in the Kraken's case, a glorified cannon-sized shotgun. Oh yeah, and in the Kraken's case, the weapon can also be refilled by simply going to the distillation table and purchasing more ammo with a catalyst organ. And even if the Wonderbus is more powerful than they give it credit for, it honestly just feels like a gimmick. Throughout my entire playthrough of the Shadow Throne, the Wonderbus was never an option I chose for weaponry. It was always my point building gun, or the sap. Both of these were far superior because I didn't have to constantly reload the weapon's ammo capacity in an obtuse and time consuming way. The Wonderbus's best use is in the Easter Egg, where it functions like a gimmick needed to progress to the next step. The best example of this Wonder Weapon concept being done much better is the Die Wonder Weapon, and its elemental variants from D Machina. Both weapons use the Undead Horde as a refill mechanic, but the standard Die can be used multiple times to great effect before needing to be refilled. And honestly, the weapon's recharge mechanic fills the weapon quite quickly, and regardless, players can simply buy ammo from the Dart Thing if they so desire. And with the recent update to Pack-a-Punch the weapon, it helps to further improve upon these qualities, with the packed variant sporting more ammo and a greater zombie to ammo conversion. And that's a major issue with World War II's uses of traps and wonder weapons. I don't think the team knew how to use either of these concepts and gameplay mechanics in an interesting and powerful way. Let's take a look at the game's first three wonder weapons, the Tesla Gun, the Ripsaw, and the Wonderbus. None of these weapons offer amazing killing potential, and are only used best in each map's respective easter eggs, as keys to unlock doors, or in this game's case, weapons that complete specific easter egg steps. And not every wonder weapon has to have an amazing one hit kill everything sort of deal like the Thunder Gun or the Apothecan Servant. There are some amazing wonder weapons that play great support roles, like the VR-11, the Skatsmith's Vigor, the Hypnotize ability from the Skull on Sapway, or even the Staff of Ra's Revive ability. But World War II's Wonder Weapons feel more like, as I said earlier, gimmicks. They're typically only used to power machines, gather spines, or respond to a mass specific quest requirement. In the Shadow Thrones Easter Egg, the Wonder Bus is used to power shock boxes, to reveal the Uber Spragen, which for some reason is trapped inside an elevator, power the four Zeppelin anchors placed around the map for the Easter Egg, and defeat the map's boss, the Stad Jaeger, during the fight's final phase. This wouldn't be an issue, but aside from its assigned uses, I'm never using the Wonder Bus in actual gameplay. The same can be said for the Tesla Gun and the Ripsaw, but at least the Tesla Gun has some cool upgrades, and the Ripsaw has the extremely useful ability to stun the Moichlers. World War II puts such an emphasis on these weapons' wonderful qualities that they forget to make them actually effective at killing the Undead Horde, and I feel like this issue finally balloons in the Shadow Throne, where the Wonder Bus is an ineffective tool only used when the game requires it to do something. At least the Tesla Gun and the Ripsaw get the added benefit of upgrades, the Wonder Bus stays in the same pitiful state from beginning to end. But I should say, the game has a silver lining with these weapons. The Wonder Weapons are always obtainable in pretty easy to reach locations, a major advantage over Treyarch, where once you give a Wonder Weapon away, it's basically gone forever and now trapped in the box. In World War II, each Wonder Weapon always stays at its respective table, and in the boss fight, the game even leaves one out there for you as it's required for the fight. That's still pretty nice. The same problem with the Wonder Weapons, though, apply to the traps, too. In every other Call of Duty entry besides AW, traps play an integral role in defeating the heavy horde of zombies for a small fee. And in nearly every Call of Duty's case, the only way to insta-kill the enemy horde effectively passed round 40, with the exception being one-hit insta-kill Wonder Weapons like the Thunder Gun, Zap Guns, Alistair's Annihilator, the Helion Salvo, the Wonderwaffe DG2, the Die from D Machina, and so on. Fun fact, these two missing factors in Infinite Damage Wonder Weapon and Traps are why Round 100 hasn't been achieved in Solo in Call of the Dead yet. And in every other Zombies entry, Traps pose a very high risk, high reward scenario, typically confining the player to a small space, with the only means of escape usually being by a back entrance or running back through the trap, with a very high chance of death if the player isn't careful. It's a great system, and they usually require a lot of planning and strategy to use. In World War II, however, traps aren't as powerful as you might think they'd be, with many of them hardly affecting the enemy you are trying to annihilate. 
In The Darkest Shore, the U-Boat Blade Trap can murder any zombie following you down the path, but because of the loose zombie pathing, many of them will simply reevaluate their course and just go the other way. And once the trap is active, the area doesn't present the pathway as a choke point, leading to many zombies simply appearing from all sides, with maybe the occasional few walking to their deaths. So for example, let's look at how Zetsubo uses its two traps, the Fan and Plane Trap. The Plane Trap blocking both pathways almost instantly, and the only escape being back under the trap itself or through the back entrance that leads to spawn. And then there's the Fan Trap. Using it will instantly kill any zombies chasing the player. But if the player wishes to access the side they previously entered from to pull more zombies into the trap, they'll have to make a long trip back around the map or run through the trap, with even the slightest misstep leading to a gruesome demise. In World War II, traps hardly present a threat as they deal extremely light damage to the player, and most of them aren't even in efficient choke points, with the Tesla trap in the Final Reich needing to attract zombies to be even useful. And honestly, in standard gameplay, I never find myself wanting to use them because they just aren't in many advantageous places to warrant their use. It reminds me a bit of all the traps implemented into Alpha Omega, but at least in Alpha Omega, they have every single trap in an efficient choke point to pick up the slack. It's honestly underwhelming. For a game series trying to elevate the zombies' experience to the next level, two of the game's most popular hallmarkers aren't thought through all that well, and it feels like the developers lost sight of this trying to make an epic experience, where the base level design is pretty bare bones and mostly forgotten about, and it's starting to make more sense why the atmosphere of World War II is so easily forgotten. The developers push aside the low-hanging fruit that make or break the experience for a high-budget one that only appeals to the minority. And unlike games like The Last of Us and Resident Evil 8, Call of Duty is an experience that's supposed to appeal to the majority, and it just feels like Michael Condre and his team were hired for the wrong job. But who knows, maybe I'm reading too deep into this. Anyways, let's talk about the map's setup. Unlike the final Reich in the Darkest Shore, the Shadow Throne features an extremely complicated setup process that fits right at home with maps like Zetsubo, Gorod, and Dead of the Night. Opening up the map is fine, but to obtain the Wonder Bus and Pack-a-Punch, players must navigate to the church, and in tandem with the model of their radio and the location marked on the map, players are able to find radio frequencies they must enter into the radio in the plaza to take Straub Zeppelin off the Russians. To input the radio frequencies, players have to spin their circle pads like they're spinning actual dials, and instead of just holding left or right, you have to actually spin them in a circular motion, which is really annoying. Now, this was done to make the gameplay feel more realistic, but I'm gonna tell you right now, I really hate this feature. The dials are extremely finicky, and spinning them can be an absolute pain in the butt. Now, the game is pretty reasonable. You don't have to land on the exact number, just the general area. But don't worry, we'll get to why this spinning dial idea sucks later with the safe step. Once the corners have been entered in, seriously, how are you supposed to figure this out on your own? You can now activate some flares found outside the museum, where you can confront Straub's war machine head-on. I must say, it's an extremely impressive sight to behold, and to see the full model in all of its glory is nothing short of fantastical. Like, look at this shot when you first leave the sewers. Furious with our survival from Helgoland, Straub fixates his attention on us and begins arming his Zeppelin's cannon to overload the zombies attacking our characters, charring their skin, and transforming them into the overloaded Gekok, or as we refer to them as Sizzlers. Sizzlers are extremely fast super sprinters that can quickly outplace the players even with stamina. Thankfully, unlike the similar Moichlers, Sizzlers are rather weak and can be taken out in just a few shots. Honestly, their health pools are pretty similar to Pest. But unlike Pest, you cannot outrun the Sizzlers under normal circumstances, and they must be defeated. And how many Sizzlers do you think Straub will create each round? One Sizzler, four Sizzlers, eight... Did you say the entire round of normal zombies can be possibly turned into Sizzlers? 
any zombie not killed that isn't a pest, bomber, or whistling will inevitably turn into a sizzler. Hide underground? You'll find a sizzler. Hide in the theater or the museum? You'll find a sizzler. It is never ending, and under normal circumstances, this is fine. Sure, you gotta deal with the occasionally changing enemy every 30 seconds. And if you're playing the Shadow Thrones with friends as a standard round based map, then you're never gonna really gonna have an issue. But if you're planning on playing the Easter Egg, then let's talk about that. Straub's grand plan to prevent Marie and her team from stopping him is to simply prevent them from completing any steps of the Easter Egg and trying to save a zombie. It's not too terribly hard to save a pest or a bomber, but believe me, trying to save a regular zombie versus trying to save one of those two are two completely different tasks. There are hundreds of zombies per round, but only a few pest or bombers. Believe me, you'll feel the difference. I will say though, I love how the Geist Cannon actually follows your movements around the map, and it's really cool to see the finished product after only seeing the prototype as referred to by Richter in the Final Reich. But, once the Sizzlers have been spawned in, the player is able to collect a Geist Bolt, and after finding its coordinating battery, you can now forge the Wonder Bus, and open Pack-a-Punch by throwing grenades at these two panels and charging them with the Wonder Bus. You'll have FINALLY unlocked the map's Pack-a-Punch. And I'm all for a more complicated introductory quest, but all of that work just to simply upgrade my weaponry? It'd be fine if every other map was presented this way but only in the Shadow Throne is the process that complicated. In the Final Reich, you just gotta press a few buttons and go down some slides. In the Darkest Shore, you just gotta ride a minecart a bit and nap some batteries along the way. In the Shadow Throne, you gotta become a radio mechanic and a Sizzler Slayer. And if you just never melee the Sizzlers, then you'll have no idea how to obtain the Geist Bolt. The map is the least friendly in terms of player progression, and it's one of the few maps where I'd be surprised if you could unlock Pack-a-Punch without a guide. On a brighter note though, let's talk about one of the map's hidden features, the melee weapon variety. Following on the success of the Ripsaw being a melee wonder weapon, players are able to find three separate melee weapons scattered around the map. There's a spiked bat in the plaza, which can perform wide multi-kills, the ice pick in the museum, which can grant the player the ability to perform a bayonet charge with increased speed, and then there's the Trench Knife, which grants the player quicker melee speed and speedy execution. Honestly, the only viable way to do executions thus far. This is such a great idea. Other than World War II and Cold War, the melee class is typically the most underutilized class in zombies, and to see it explored so much in this map is amazing, and it's one of the map's shining ideas. Moving on from regular weapons, let's talk about the map's main quest, and where players can obtain Geistcraft infused versions of these melee weapons. After summoning the Zeppelin and building the Wonderbus, the player can begin three separate quest lines, each culminating in the collection of three upgraded melee weapons, which are honestly more impressive than the Wonderbus. Finding and entering frequencies found in the Wonderbus room, players are able to find and arm the smuggler in the sewers. What's really interesting about this step is that players can inspect the bullets found on the table to learn what weapon they need to give them. I remember when this map first came out, people believed it was completely random. And I know if you watch a Mr. Dalek JD, Noah J, or Mr. Raffle Waffle's guide, each of them will tell you to give the smuggler random weapons until it works. And wow, who would have thought? None of them learned the exact method, because YouTube Easter egg culture is not about being right, but being first. What a great guide, Noah! Granted, to give them a bit of credit though, Noah and Milo did narrow it down to simply buying various wall weapons, which is true. ...and how he doesn't have a weapon to defend himself with, and you must now arm the smuggler by activating the hole in the ground to pass him a weapon. Now, as it stands, there isn't any real logic to this. It seems to be complete random, and we assumed it to be a weapon type. Some of the working weapons for this step include the right revolver, the combat shotgun, the bar, and the MP40. But honestly, just use the zombie subreddit web guides. They work a lot better than the YouTubers half-baked ones. And if you want to watch a YouTube guide, then look up guides from smaller YouTubers. Those who are smaller on the platform are more likely to make sure the steps that they talk about are actually correct. After a few more rounds, the player can now find the smuggler again in the plaza. Using the Gib Jolts feature in a pretty cool way, the player is able to share their points with the smuggler to help him advance. 
Once he's through, you're able to go to his apartment and knock on the door three times, with a whistling waiting for you beside his corpse. Fun fact! If you give the smuggler a pack-a-punch weapon, he'll have actually defeated the whistling for you, just in his dying breaths. But once you've defeated the whistling, you get what I call the Geist Bat. With a powerful melee swing, the bat can produce long-range Geist Bolts that kill all in its way. It's really cool if you know what you're doing, and it's probably one of the easiest ones to get. Next up is the Nazi Axe. The player has to go around the map and look around for various frequencies. These will all be etched into the walls in six different locations around the map. Now you need to find what your frequency is and then enter them into the radio in the plaza. Doing this will unlock Morse code the player has to Yeah, no, we're not doing that. Hi, it's me, Gamer Man. Don't do this. Here, take this quick visual guide. It's going to save you a lot of hours of pain. Now grab this magnifying glass from the theater and brute force these possible coordinates. These are the only coordinates it can be. Once done, you'll get a bull. Finally, a Morse code step I can skip. Once you brute force the Morse code like a normal person and gather the bull, you can take it to the museum and place it on the scale. Now, execute a sizzler near an armor machine and purchase the armor to obtain the head. Now place the head on the scale and kill zombies, with the guy's crap being collected inside this porcelain hair here. Seriously, the logic of this quest is silly and insane to say the least. Once the hair has been filled up, seriously, what does that even mean? The player is granted the Nazi axe. Much like the ripsaw previous, Pressing the run button while running, the player will enter a bayonet charge, greatly increasing their speed, and being the only way to outpace a sizzler. While charging, the player can rush into a zombie to cause an execution. Upon impact, the axe will release a Geistcraft burst, killing surrounding enemies. This is an extremely fun wonder weapon, and it fits right at home with many others in the series, while still being simple and effective. And finally, there's the dreaded Dancer's Dagger. Collecting a painting and film reel around the map, the player can turn on the projector in the theater, presenting a location where they have to kill zombies. Using these tiny dolls as indicators, the player can fill up the dolls, making sure to count the amount of souls they collected by each doll. Once four dolls have been filled around the map, the player will now have a four number sequence. To enter this sequence, you'll have to go to the safe found in the apartment buildings. And while I understand how to open this safe now, this is without a doubt the map's most infamous step. There's no instructions, no indications to tell you if you're doing it right or wrong, and no guaranteed way to know if you've counted the kills correctly. The Dancer's Dagger can be one of the map's hardest steps. I couldn't figure this step out for the life of me, and it didn't help that no one knew how to do it either. A lot of the hype for this game has died down, with the only help coming from the COD Zombie subreddit. So, let's say you gathered your numbers and you confirmed your combination. Great, but now you've arrived at the safe. How do you input the combination? Well, first of all, don't do this in solo. For the love of God, get a friend to hold the zombie. The only chance you'll have to input the combination in solo is either with Shell Shock or at the end of the round, and you have just barely enough time at the end of the round. And of course, to spin the dials, the players have to spin their controller sticks like the radio dials earlier. And while the game is actually quite lenient with how you land in your numbers, seriously, as long as you do not go over to another number, you are allowed to slightly miss the number and head back to it. So for example, Let's say I have this number I'm spinning to right here, I can go slightly over the number, and as long as I don't pass the next number, I'll be fine. But here's the thing, there's really nothing telling you about this information at all. And after countless attempts and a whole bunch of different videos, I finally unlocked the godforsaken safe. So here's what you do. To fully reset your combination, you must spin the safe clockwise three times. Once done, you may land on your number, the first number. From there, you can go to your second number by spinning counterclockwise. Now, spin back clockwise to your third number, and finally, spin counterclockwise to your fourth number. Press the B button when you're ready, and if done correctly, the handle will open the safe. If any of your numbers are wrong, you've spun incorrectly, or while spinning, you simply spun past your number, then you will fail to open the safe. It doesn't sound difficult on paper, but let's take a look at other dial steps that do the same action quite effectively. In Mauer or Toten, the player is invisible to all threats, and moving the numbers on the dial is as simple as pressing the shoulder buttons. And with the three separate dials, players aren't going to get confused by which part of the sequence that they're on or how to reset it. Or about Tog's dials, even if you ignore the sound indication that plays, Players will be able to hold the interact button on the left or right side of the dial, turning it as such. And because there's four separate dials, you can work through it one number at a time, without the need to reset. Or what about Tog's safe step, where you simply blow it open with a bomb? 
there's Jarizendrox safe step, which is a simple three pattern code, a step that simplifies the process for all, or what about Garag Krovi's safe, where you simply blow the darn thing open with the power of your giant fist. The point is, realism can severely hurt the game, and this safe step is easily one of the game's biggest examples of why realism doesn't always translate to success. But what do you get when you actually open the curse thing? Well, you actually get the Dancer's Dagger, one of the map's best wonder weapons. Performing an execution at full health, the player can restore an entire armor piece. Easily, one of the map's most useful tools. And unlike the Wonder Bus, provides extremely useful utility and support capabilities. Trust me, besides maybe the Nazi Axe, this is one of the best of the three solely for that purpose. And besides specific specialist mods or consumables, this is the game's first way to restore lost armor pieces without purchasing more, with the requirement being extremely simple, especially because it's a fast execution too. And once you've collected all three wonder weapons, you can now place them within the walls by the side of the church. After killing 20 zombies, 10 sizzlers, and 10 pests, the player is given access to the courtyard. Once the Zeppelin Anchor is charged, the player is now locked within the courtyard until they complete the puzzle of the Raven Lords. I'd highly recommend saving a pest for this step, as Straub can still turn zombies into sizzlers while trapped in here, and you can't escape until it's complete. Using this simple Raven calculator, you can turn the statues on each wall side, revealing a Raven. Once all four have been acquired, the player can now place all four around the statue, which is a lot harder than you'd think in Solo. And here's the thing, they have to be placed in a correct order and the correct size. It's, it's weird, just, just look at the way I place them and copy that. But once you've correctly assembled the ravens, you'll have freed the blade of Barbarossa's sword. A few quick storyline nitpicks make me wonder, why has no one in this city ever entered this courtyard? And if they have, like let's say the city put this locking mechanism in the, in the first place, why are these guys crafting fused locking mechanisms here? Did Straub know to leave the mechanism here so our crew wouldn't be able to access the area? And if so, why didn't he try to claim the blade for himself? And if he didn't know, then why did he place the locking mechanism in the first place? He's the only one that knows about Geistcraft, right? If the melee weapon locking mechanism was here before Straub got here, then it begs the question, who the heck instated it in the first place? If people have entered, then how come no one has noticed that if you turn all the statues forward, they reveal a metallic raven? How does our crew even know the exact placements of the ravens on the statue besides guessing and checking, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense? And how does doing all of this work reveal the blade in the first place? Their entire objective is to stop Dr. Straub. It just so happened to be that the blade was in an area where they were traveling to. What if our crew just simply waltzed past it and escaped the courtyard without being locked in? I had the same issue with the Darkest Shore. How does our crew know all of this work would reveal the pommel? The same question applies to the Shadow Throne. At least in the final Reich, our quest obviously involves the Hilt of Barbarossa's sword. But in these two maps, the related sword pieces just happen to fall into our lap along the way. And at least in the Darkest Shore, half of our quest is somewhat related to the Statue of Nerthus, so that's fine. But in the Shadow Throne, you literally stumble upon the darn thing by accident trying to get onto the Zeppelin. A simple rewrite would have gone a long way to fixing this quest. What if instead of stumbling upon the blade, our heroes need its power to overload Straub's machines, putting more importance on it? Or maybe you could even have the two groups fight for control over the weapon, even in a climactic scene where we could behead Straub. But whatever. So once you've powered all the anchors around the map, a drop pod is lowered into the plaza, making it significantly harder to train in the area. But it's how you enter the boss arena, so whatever. Powering the zipline cord with your wonder weapon, players are brought into the arena. If you have a sensitivity to lights, make sure you look away while powering the cord. It can be quite blinding, and honestly, the whole Zeppelin boss fight is a very big seizure warning, so I'd recommend looking away if that's an issue. But I don't have that problem, so let's talk about the Shadow Thrones boss fight. But before getting into the fight, the player has to guide the Geistcraft energy around the room using control panels. This can take quite a bit, so be sure to save a zombie, as Unlike nearly every other boss fight, the Shadow Throne uses the game's natural round pool, with the only way to obtain max ammos being from the pest rounds, so make sure your bullets count. But seriously, Sledgehammer devs, what the heck kind of decision even is that? You guys don't want to give me any max ammos to do this boss fight? Once the energy has reached Straub's room, the Doctor will finally meet his demise in an extremely fitting way. It's quite gruesome, but for the first time in Zombies history, we defeat an actual human antagonist, and an only DLC too. What? This is impossible. This is not possible. Drop it to the bedroom. Stay away. Do you hear me? I created you. No. No.
I have to commend Kondre and his team for the bold move. Once you've defeated Straub, it's time to battle his final creation, the Stadjäger. Forged using the intense energy of pure Geistcraft, the Stadjäger is immune to attacks unless provoked. This battle takes place over three phases. In the first phase, the player should prioritize corralling the enemy horde and taking their time attacking the Stadjäger. Ammo is essential. You'll know the first phase is complete when he begins to overload himself with his own Geist Bolts, allowing himself to create Sizzlers. Now, the player can attack him while he is charging and creating Sizzlers too. Honestly, if I couldn't bring the Dancer's Dagger with me, I'd hate this boss fight. The room is extremely cramped, and it's quite easy to get it caught on extended edges and rogue map terrain. Using Shell Shock and Jack in the Boxes is quite helpful and needed to get out of sticky situations. But above all else, the Dancer's Dagger makes the armor system bearable, because I can actually regain such a precious resource and especially in an arena where armor regeneration is not possible. Once you've gotten past the second phase, the Zeppelin will begin to collapse, and the Stad Jaeger will overload himself one last time. Again. Now summoning Geistcraft Storms. While in this stage, only the Wonderbus will affect him, forcing the weapon's usage. But once enough damage has been dealt, the Stad Jaeger will finally shoot himself in the head with a Geistcraft Bolt, finally putting itself out of its misery. The Zeppelin boss fight is not my favorite boss fight, especially with Stad Jaeger's glitchy hit detection. Honestly, he just feels super unsatisfying to attack, but I can't really describe it into words. But the boss fight offers a stellar experience. The flashing lights, the spinning drop pods, Straub's death, the repetitive but fitting music, the dynamic nature of the Stad Jaeger, and the unique animations and audio quotes signifying new attacks and phase changes. And finally, the music is just perfect. Something I haven't mentioned in this review yet is the game's use of its tunes and musical overtures. This one in particular is my favorite, and usually plays whenever you overcome a major obstacle or finish a boss fight. It truly makes me feel accomplished. I can understand how some might feel it's overused, but it's one of my absolute favorites. Another thing is, I can't understate the Dancer's Dagger's usefulness. The ability to refill armor and ammo is paramount. You can also scavenge ammo for the Wonderbus, which is weird, but a lot quicker than actually trying to refill it by siphoning energy using Geist Bolts, so whatever. But once you've successfully defeated Straub's City Killer, you can escape through the drop pod and back onto the streets. How you survive this fall without your organs bursting, I really don't know. But once down, the cutscene commences, featuring our characters getting cornered by the theater. Running low on ammunition, their situation only grows more dire, as even a Master Moistler arrives to eviscerate our characters once and for all. In one of the game's best looking shots, the end seems near for our heroes until Rodeau, the man from the first intro cutscene, comes in to save our characters, running down the Master Moistler before getting them all to safety. And just like every other cutscene in the game, I can't gush enough how amazing these look, especially when you compare them to Treyarch's work, who have such a deep-set fear of people plucking their cutscenes and posting them online. Instead of, you know, just creating good-looking cutscenes. Honestly, Sledgehammer just knows what they're doing in this department. And finally, before ending, let's talk about the Blade of Barbarossa. The reason I talk about it at the end is because it was the last thing I got footage for after finishing the boss fight. Pressing the right trigger will perform an extremely powerful one-hit slash, but by pressing the left trigger, the player performs a wide swing, which unleashes an insanely powerful blast of Geistcraft. While this yields no points, the ability will kill nearly every enemy type with one hit, with the exception being the whistling, which makes sense. 
The one enemy type that prevents the blade from getting any player to round 1000 by simply pressing the left trigger. The big one's gonna move. Ooh. The blade finally represents the raw power of this so-called ancient wonder weapon, and picks up a lot of the slack left behind by the pommel. But seriously, the blade is amazing. So we're about 4 out of 5 with wonder weapons on this map, with the wonder bush just being the map's worst. Oh, another really cool feature is that once you completed the easter egg, with no one to man the zeppelin, sizzlers no longer spawn on the map, so that's pretty cool. Although the cannon still moves around attempting to aim it at zombies, so that's a funny oversight. And fun fact, once the easter egg is completed, the standard encounter music changes too. And that's how I describe the Shadow Throne, one of my most mixed opinions so far. I went into this experience expecting to hate the Darkest Shore and loving the Shadow Throne, but at the end of the day, the Shadow Throne came up lacking a bit more than the Darkest Shore. Both maps aren't really offering game-changing experiences, but the Darkest Shore has a much better easter egg that complements the game design more, whereas the Shadow Throne feels more like a glorified melee quest with a boss fight at the end, because it wouldn't be an easter egg quest line without a boss fight, I suppose. And the Darkest Shore just offers more interesting lore that the Shadow Throne is severely missing. And that's why I'd rate the map so middle of the road. It's got a lot of really good ideas, but the map falls just short of great experience, and needed a bit more time in the oven to get right in my opinion. So what's next? You can't get more device than these maps, right? Right? Um, excuse me if this part of the review does sound weird because I am currently sick, but as they say in show business, the show must go on. Also, it's been four months and I have to get this review out eventually. Ah yes, the tortured path. Some might call it the original outbreak from Cold War, some might not even refer to it as a Call of Duty Zombies experience. And then there's me, the Call of Duty Zombies player who likes Voyage of Despair. So does my opinion even matter anymore? But if you can't tell by the number in the top right, I didn't like the Tortured Path all that much. So what's the story? Following the events of the Shadow Throne, the zombie horde is now left under the loose command of the Nazi army and Hitler, and are found to be roaming the countryside and terrorizing the European theater, rekindling the war thought to have been brought to an end. Following this, Hank Rideau forms the Bureau of Archaic Technologies, an organization driven by the goal of finishing the zombie outbreak once and for all. While our heroes make their way toward an ancient Thulean temple in the middle of the Antarctic, the members of the Bureau are tasked with gathering the pieces of the sword and getting them to our heroes in New Swabia. The Tortured Path is split between three consecutive locations, a lot like Cold War's Outbreak, but the mode features a massively overhauled zombies experience. Over the course of ten uniquely curated rounds, players will fight an accelerated onslaught of enemies, with a boss fight topping it all off at round ten. The mode also features a revamped way to obtain armors and weapons. Unlike the standard mystery box, the map features Waffen boxes. Purchasing from the Waffen box, players will be given a random assortment of weapons of the given type that they purchased. As players purchase weapons, they'll also have a chance to obtain Jack in the Boxes as an added bonus. I really like Waffen boxes. It divides the game's weapons up by weapon type, and considering the fact that this game has the largest variety of weapons in the series, it makes it a lot easier to get what you want because the Waffen boxes will randomly give you weapons, but it will not repeat a weapon cycle until at least every weapon has been handed out to you at least once. This is an amazing little feature that goes a long way to ensure that players can properly load themselves out against the zombie horde. So let's get into the challenges thrown at us, shall we? At rounds 3, 6, and 9, players will be tasked with completing various objectives. These include defeating a small assault of master moichlers, thankfully weaker ones, repairing radio scattered around the map, 
defending supplies for a certain period of time, defeating a specific bomb before it automatically destroys supplies, and so on. There's quite a large variety of challenges, with some of them being a lot easier than others though. Defeating a few Moichlers is surprisingly a lot easier than defeating an Onslaught of Sizzlers. Defeating the VIZ before he reaches the payload is so much easier than defending supplies on round 6. Repairing radios? I'll take that any day over trying to stop Sizzlers from defeating too many zombies in Beneath the Ice. The variety is extremely unbalanced, and some games are a breeze, while others are painstakingly terrible. While attempting to beat Beneath the Ice, the third map for the first time, I literally couldn't finish round 6 because I kept getting the defend objective, and because you get Pack-a-Punch a minimum of round 7, it can be quite overwhelming to defeat the Horde, as their health scales to about round 15 at that time. But once I didn't get the objective on round 6, I won on that try. It causes the game mode to feel a tad unbalanced, and sadly, you're just gonna have to rely on a bit of luck to get you through. Never before in Zombies have players had their games end because they got unlucky. Unless you count the mystery box, that's a choice that you make. Any scenario can always be saved by smart planning and quick thinking, but in the tortured path, sometimes you just fail, and it can be extremely frustrating. The silver lining though, is that a standard run through of the tortured path takes about 15 to 30 minutes, so it's quite easy to jump back into the action and get back to where you last left off fairly quickly. A very intentional decision when designing the game mode. The developers wanted this to be more of an arcade shooter type of game, where you constantly go in, fail, and retry it, making it so that the end isn't as achievable as often as you might like it to be. At the end of each objective round, players will be given a supply drop. Opening these crates grants players a max ammo, a random assortment of weapons, and melee choices, and the ever so beautiful armor drop. Or to make a joke similar to Diego from the map 9, Amo, Amor, is it coincidence that they sound so much alike? And at round 10, you can battle different boss fights. For example, in the first map, Into the Storm, the player faces the Rockin' Brenner, an enhanced version of the Brenner with a Geistcraft aura. Leading him into an airstrike barrage will temporarily disable its Geistcraft barrier and allow players to swiftly defeat him. Defeating a Tortured Path boss will also grant players the engineering parts. These are special attachments in the Tortured Path game mode that increase a specific weapon's damage by 10%. There are a ton of weapons, so it provides a lot of replayability, and it's quite exciting to get one for a weapon that you actually use, and extremely disappointing when you get one for a weapon that you don't use. Ah yes, my favorite weapon, the Warmensburg Spiz, the Call of Duty classic. Another interesting feature is the new level up system. Unique to the Tortured Path, as players level up, they'll be granted damage bonuses in only public lobbies. As players work towards their way towards level 50, they'll cap out at an increase of 200% damage output. It's a super cool idea, and it rewards players for continued play, but the standard damage output does the job just fine too. And now that we've gone over the game mode's unique features, let's get into each map and their subsequent easter eggs. Into the Storm the first chapter of our playing experience takes place at a Spanish port. Our heroes must locate the hilt of Barbarossa's sword and escape with their lives. What the hilt is doing here, I have literally no idea. The map features one main loop with little variation in terms of overall map flow and architecture. I don't really enjoy the map design or hate it either. It's a very middle of the road experience and quite forgettable. A lot like Cold War's Outbreak, Into the Storm feels like a generic World War II multiplayer map with zombies thrown in it. And wouldn't you know, the map is a hodgepodge of five different multiplayer maps all strung together. The map could have used a Geistcraft infused lightning tower, or even based it just around a Spanish Nazi outpost. For first impressions, the setting is extremely mundane. And then there's the map's main quest, which begins by requiring players to locate six zombie pieces over 30 different locations. You know what brother, why not? And then you have to shoot down this rope hanging off this tree by one of the Pack-a-Punch nodes. Once you move on to round 2, the rope will have made its way to this tree. Interacting with it will bring it off of the clip. Once done, a drop pod will appear on round 4, and you can collect two metal pylons from it. And on round 5, you must now cause a whistling to charge into another whistling, killing it and dismembering its mace. Now, with all of these pieces, the player can stop the windmill with the mace, but only in a specific spot. If the windmill is either just barely a spot ahead, or one spot behind you, you will not be able to place the parts that you've gathered. This step can be very infuriating, and while the zombies don't bleed out, the amount of times that I barely miss the windmill is insane, especially in solo, where it is a lot harder to actually time when to stop the windmill. But finally, once you've aligned the windmill, 
and flipped around, the zombie will become electrocuted by a bolt of lightning, and it'll drop to the ground. Souls can now be collected for his body. A weird criticism I want to give is that the sound effect chosen when the zombie falls off the windmill after being struck by lightning is weirdly comical. Why this sound effect? Now, this is where the easter egg can be extremely stupid. The amount of souls you fill up will determine its health for the upcoming steps. But round 6 is also an objective round. So let's say you get something like the Moitler Assault, which provides you with hardly any souls, or the Defend Objective, which is almost impossible in round 6 in solo, and almost impossible to fill up the zombie, because the Defend Objective usually won't take place around its body. But let's just say that you get an objective that allows you to freely kill a bunch of zombies. Great! You'll have filled our undead friend with enough souls to begin his slow escort around the map. Now let me explain how infuriating this step is. First of all, the zombie is extremely slow. And second of all, even at maximum health, the zombie can be insta-killed by a whistling, which happens a little more than you think it would. Or let's just say you left a bunch of bombs lying around and you shot one on accident. Those can kill him too if they explode. And if you kill too many zombies for the round while trying to defend him, you won't even have enough zombies to fill up this Pack-a-Punch node, so you can't even access Pack-a-Punch on round 7. The amount of time it took to complete this step was nauseating, and easily the game's worst. But let's say he makes it to the house, and then he'll slip under the stairs. Congratulations! You've completed the step. You can now complete the round, and now you've arrived at the last step. Our allied friend stumbles out with a battery. Now you must collect kills around him and fill up the battery but do not let him die, and once he's collected enough energy, only THEN can he be killed by zombies! And if for some reason he dies, and the battery hasn't been filled up, then the step automatically fails. You can't pick up the battery, you just lose. And you failed the entire run! Never in any zombies easter egg have there been this many win-fail conditions like this. In Garai Krovi, you can hide from the bomb step at Pack-a-Punch. In Attack of the Radioactive Thing, you can reset the chemistry step if need be. And in Carrier, players are allowed as many attempts as possible to complete the Bachenko step. But only in World War II Zombies did the devs say, Yeah, this step blows. Release it. But let's say you've escorted the zombie, you filled the battery, and he dies properly. Only then will we be able to collect the completed battery and open this vault door underneath the winery, where the hilt of Barbarossa's sword resides. Collecting this will also grant the player all six perks. What a mess of an easter egg. Quite short, but if you get some really bad objective rounds, or continually get unlucky trying to escort the zombie, it can go on for quite a while. But with the Rackenbrenner defeated on round 10, an additional round 11 will begin, where players have a minute to arrive at the exfil point and survive. A lot like exfilling in Cold War, exfilling in the Tortured Path is also extremely underwhelming. But for the opposite reason, it's underwhelming in Cold War. In Cold War, players have to kill a specific number of zombies while inside the exfil point. As they are defeated, the ordeal becomes exponentially easier, as if it was even hard in the first place. In the Tortured Path, there isn't a kill requirement to exfil, so players can simply train zombies around the map and then enter the exfil point at the last second. My ideal exfil would require players to stand in a large open area, as they are assaulted by every zombie type imaginable, increasing the zombie cap to 50 or 60 or something stupid like that, and then forcing players to fight for their lives, maybe even sprinkle in a Brenner, a Moichler, or even a Panzer Mortar in there to spice things up. Something not reasonably killable, but there to enforce danger. But that's just me, though. Once you've exfilled, Rodeau will spout the same three quotes, and the map will end. What an aggravating experience. The basic gameplay of the Tortured Path isn't amazing or anything, but it's the easter egg that really brings down the experience. I genuinely don't think I can properly express how poorly this map's easter egg was designed. Play it for yourself, and you'll quickly see what I mean. Coming up next is Chapter 2, Across the Sea. Taking place on the USS Mount Olympus, this map was basically Voyage of Despair before Voyage of Despair. A lot like Carrier though, the map doesn't really use all the space of the ship, with nearly 60% of it just being inaccessible. Okay, I'm sorry, I like it when the map designers use all the space that they've laid out, okay? Honestly, I think Voyage of Despair did that beautifully. Come on, look at my credentials, I'm basically certified to say this stuff. Another really interesting mechanic is the ship's tilt. 
every few minutes the ship will lean on one side, causing the trucks on the front end of the ship to move positions. This can severely change the map flow. The map design is split between the main deck and plenty of CQC areas scattered throughout the ship's interior. It's a pretty cramped map, and it's a bomber zombies field day. I don't hate the map design, but without a dedicated armor machine, sometimes losing armor can just feel a bit unfair. And finally, there's just the question of how this undead horde continues to arrive on the ship. A very similar issue I have with Carrier. There couldn't have been this many crew members on the ship, right? In the briefing for the map, they explain that there are U-boats trying to stop anyone trying to get close to Antarctica, so I guess it's implied that the Nazis are sending, you know, zombies and U-boats across the ocean. But that just doesn't seem realistic, does it? At least the trials and chaos bend the rules of reality and continue to indefinitely create monstrosities without end. And across the sea, the game just kind of shrugs and goes, here they are. It is super cool though how the game uses the drowned textures for the regular and whistling zombies from the darkest shore. And finally, there's the map's easter egg. What an absolute doozy. By meleeing this battery by Pack-a-Punch, players are able to enter a Geistcraft infused vision. While inside this hallucination, zombies will begin to disappear and reappear out of thin air, making it much harder to navigate the round safely. On round 2, the player is able to begin hunting down flopping fish in various locations. By shooting all 9 groups of fish, our exozombies favorite, the red herring, will appear. Following the red herring, players will be able to purchase a mysterious battery from Uber Schnell Wallby for 3,000 points, taking the battery to the red herring. Trust me, this is going somewhere. Players will then be able to fill up that battery, and then follow the red herring to a new location. Repeating this two more times will finish the step. Along the way, players should also purchase perks, weapons, and pack-a-punch, just on a really strict budget as the Uber Schnells cost a total of 9,000 points. Once the third battery is filled, the red herring will teleport us to a mysterious realm, one where we can see visions of each of our previous adventures from the Final Reich, the Darkest Shore, and the Shadow Throne, with each area being filled with cute little trinkets and map icons. In the Shadow Throne area, you can even see the Zeppelin not too far off in the distance. And finally, the egg ends with a classic game of cup and ball, with the ball being replaced by our dear friend the red herring. This is genuinely difficult, and on the third and final game, there are eight cups. See if you can keep up with it real quick. Now, if you follow the right cup, or guess correctly, the trial will finally end. Failing will result in an ever-increasing barrage of tough enemies. In one run, it got to the point where I was fighting two Moichlers, two Whistlings, and then after that I had failed another cup game, the game spawned in five Whistlings at once in this tiny little circle. But if you manage to succeed, or cheat, this crate next to Pack-a-Punch will be opened, revealing the pommel. And what did the red herring have to do with any of that? I don't know, but he was funny. Dang it, Red Herring, you've done it again. This will also take you out of the blurred vision and grant you the rest of the perks. And finally, on round 10, our boss encounter is the Shadow Throne Stadjäger, and thankfully he's much weaker than his Shadow Throne counterpart. But the player will have to momentarily wait as he charges himself up between phases. But once done, you'll be able to exfil and escape, ending this really weird experience. And while I like the easter egg much more than my endeavors in Into the Storm, this quest's nonsensical nature conflicts with a lot of the themes and ideas set up by Michael Condre and his team when the game first started. And a lot like what I flagged IW for, you can have fun, but let it make sense in the rules and bounds of the universe that you created. Michael and his team did a great job to ground the game in reality when it first started, and began to only leave those borders when creating more fantastical set pieces, like the Grand Zeppelin from Shadow Throne, or the Corpse Gate from The Darkest Shore. The fish quest just feels really out of place and inconsistent with the rest of the mode. Like, I'd be fine if it was more like a zombie leading the way through the quest, or you know, maybe like the ghost of Klaus, but it's a red herring. And also just because it's a fish, that doesn't really make any sense. And finally, let's move on to the final experience, Beneath the Ice. 
Finally following our heroes back to New Swabia, Marie and her allies attempt to solve the riddles and decipher the ancient history, as they await the arrival of the pieces of Barbarossa's sword, now reclaimed by the Bureau. Beneath the Ice offers some of the DLC's best theming. An ancient Thulian temple is honestly really cool, and the devs did such a good job designing it. It's a shame it wasn't the whole DLC though, as the first two maps can feel rather superfluous as a whole. This map feels like the real meat and potatoes, which is why it's a shame it's about the same size as the other two. And then there's the map's quest. And you all thought the other two were convoluted, specific, and downright silly. Believe me, our silly meters are only halfway filled. On round one, the player can melee this battery found in the altar room. Yes, we're meleeing another battery. Doing so will allow you to see rune combinations hidden on the walls during even number rounds. But we're not doing that. So here, take this paper filled with 25 different codes and brute force those combinations into the rune wall. And let me say in solo, this can take forever. Once you've entered in the right rune combination, you can end the round and the Bureau will airdrop in the Hilt of Barbarossa sword. Also, make sure when you're entering in your code, even if your code doesn't amount to eight total in inputs, you need to enter eight inputs to reset it so you can try another code. Believe me, this will save you a lot of time when solving the step. Once placed into the altar, an earthquake will happen and cause this flare box to fall over and open by the front of the area. Now, take these flares that have dropped out, and the player now has to throw them into four fire pits in the altar room. Yeah, yeah, this is what we're doing. And once done, you can throw one more into this bowl right by the front, and the wall by the side will pop open, revealing a rune you can now set inside the wall. And brute force, 25 more combinations! Woo! Honestly, I don't have the energy to be mad anymore. Once you've guessed the right one, the Bureau will just for some reason airdrop you the pommel, place it into the altar, and you can begin the final step. Now stand on one of the blood panels in the corners of the map and fill it up until blood completely consumes the panel. Once done, the final rune will reveal itself in the middle of the map. Brute force the codes one last time, and the Bureau will airdrop the blade which I guess they've had in their possession this whole time. Wonderful! Once you've gathered all three pieces, you can now assemble the Blade of Barbarossa! Oh man, this thing's gonna be amazing! We've been hyping it up throughout the game's first four maps, and with it in our hands, the undead should yield! Honestly, it's just kinda eh. The Blade has a ton of abilities, but unlike many wonder weapons of the game's past, the Blade's abilities are extremely convoluted, and some of them don't really make a whole lot of sense. If the player presses the right trigger, the sword will perform a slash. If the zombie isn't killed by the immediate attack, the enemy will be stunned by a Geistcraft energy. This is extremely useful for taking out and stunning whistlings. Holding the left trigger while pressing the right trigger will cause the player to perform a deep slash, much like an execution, that can kill any regular zombie or pest in a single hit. Once enough of the undead have been killed, the sword's gem will begin to glow. Executing a zombie now will allow players to bestow a zombie with power. Doing so will take away an armor slot, but any players that go down in that orb's range will be revived. Quite similar to classes of revival due to the hilt in the first map. Once the orb is used, the player will then regain their armor slot. What is funny is that players are able to purposely hinder themselves if they bestow a total of three zombies, leaving the player armorless. Bear in mind, buying armor does not restore those lost pieces though. And finally, pressing your controller's dedicated melee button will release a Geistcraft Slash that functions just like the blade in the Shadow Throne. Oh, also, none of these abilities grant you money either, so have fun being poor. But aside from the Geist Slash already presented on the Shadow Throne, the sword is somewhat underwhelming. Its new abilities are situational at best, and its old abilities were already good in the first place. I feel like the weapon just needed that extra, you know, push to make it one of a kind. And slapping all these new abilities can be cool, until you realize that they aren't really that useful, and you can just go back to some pressing the melee button and get to whatever round you want. But finally, with the blade claimed, we can encounter the round 10 boss, the Guardian. The DLC's fully original boss fight, sporting a black hole ability to pull players in, a wide swing, and heavy damage, the Guardian is a pretty difficult boss fight, and can take some patience and thinking to take down. Unlike the DLC's two previous fights, once below a certain health threshold, the Guardian will begin to consume the blood fountains found in the middle of the map, regaining health. This is an extremely dynamic way to increase the length of your boss fight, without destroying the pacing, with a larger health bar like in the Shadow Throne Stadjaeger. Keen-eyed and experienced players can prevent the boss from regaining too much health. 
and inexperienced players will have to adapt quickly if they wish to prevent too much health regeneration and prevail. It's easily the DLC's best boss fight, unless you're using Frontline and the M1A1 Carbine, because sometimes game design is just a joke. And with that, the temple will begin to collapse, and the exfil will begin. And since I've completed all three easter eggs, here's the map's outro cutscene. I said, here's the map's outro cutscene. Okay, there, there, there uh, uh, okay, give me a minute, there's, there's, there's gotta be something I did wrong. You know, uh, okay, so we did the first map, we, we did the second map, we did the third map. Uh, okay, I, I think I did something wrong here. Oh, here it is. Huh. So apparently... You, you can't complete all three Easter eggs, but they have to be done in a row, one after the other. Excuse me for a moment while I go wallow in a pit of my own despair. A voyage of despair, if you will. So don't worry, everyone! I'll just do it again! Thankfully, this can still be done in a private match. But after suffering for literally four hours trying to redo Into the Storm, I finally went back through and completed all three, one after the other. And if I got a stupid objective on round 6 and beneath the ice, I think I would have screamed. Finally, upon escaping, you are rewarded with the world's quietest cutscene. As the temple begins to collapse, our heroes make it out in just the nick of time. As Marie and Olivia say literally nothing, Jostin and Jefferson have a quick discussion about all the history that's now been lost. Jefferson claims it's not lost, and they all head back to the plane with their mission finally complete. I'm not even paraphrasing here, that's literally all that happens. The map just suddenly ends and the camera does a crane shot to reveal the Geistcraft hiding just beneath the ice. Nah, 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 nah. I know, I'm hilarious. And that's the tortured path. Some cool notes though, are that each time you complete a piece of the easter egg, you're also rewarded with weapon camos. That's a really neat idea. And of course, there are the survival maps. Originally, when the DLC first came out, the survival maps were unavailable until the community completed the egg for the first time. So that now we've completed the egg, let's talk about those survival maps. In Bodega Cervantes, the first survival map, players are able to play Into the Storm with a few changes made. First of all, all the Waffen boxes have been reverted back to standard wall buys, and for some reason, specifically, Electric Cherry and Quick Revive have swapped places. The survival maps also reintroduce the armor stand and the mystery box. The main addition to the enemy roster, though, is the Brenner, who shows up at every 10 rounds. Inside the mystery box are all the weapons previously available, including the base Tesla gun, the Ripsaw, and each of the Shadow Thrones melee weapons. <laughs> even the devs realized the Wonder Bus was a silly gimmick, and not an actual weapon. Each map even offers a way to upgrade the Pack Punch, so players can obtain the upgraded Tesla gun, the Ripsaw, and the melee weapons. In the first map, the player can upgrade the Pack-a-Punch by playing a shooting gallery game by the river. This is also impossible in solo. Why do you hate me, Sledgehammer? Don't us solo players matter to you? In USS Mount Olympus, the second map, the player simply has to turn six valves around the map. Much easier than the first map's quest. Once done, a red cap will appear in the Pack-a-Punch room. This allows players to upgrade the aforementioned weapons. The only one I was able to pull out of the box, though, was the axe, but that camo looked amazing on it. An interesting fact is that USS Mount Olympus is the only map in Ruler 2 Zombies where whistlings don't appear, making it instantly the game's best map. And finally, in the third and final survival map, Altar of Blood, players are able to access the upgraded Pack-a-Punch by inputting this code into the rune wall. Once done, you can find the red cap and upgrade the machine. Another cool easter egg is the addition of the sword. By offering 1,750 points at each of the four stone altars around the map, and at the three altar bowls in the middle of the map, players can then go down and be granted access to the Sword of Barbarossa. With a full round based map at our disposal, we can eviscerate to our heart's content. And finally, there's the addition of the Brenner at the end of every 10 rounds. 
I really enjoy these survival maps. They're a great way to jump into the action of zombies fairly quickly, and without the need to buy doors, you can become set up as early as round 10. This can also be a fault though, as the gameplay can become quite stagnant. But with friends, any map is sure to be a blast. And once players reach level 50 in the Tortured Path game mode, they'll have a weapon damage increase of 200% in public matches, and whenever you start a chapter of the Tortured Path, players will then be able to interact with a Red Skull, and begin an endeavor called the Darkened Path. In the Darkened Path, the game will spawn in more zombies, with increased health and more difficult objective rounds, and during each of the chapter's boss fights, the game will also summon in additional Moichlers alongside the boss. Somehow, every single time I did a boss fight, I was always caught off guard by them. Completing the Darkened Path offers no specific reward, but simply gives continued players new ways to play, and I couldn't be happier that I exist. While I might not love the mode, its inclusion is always welcomed. You don't have to play it, but it's there if you want it. But in conclusion, the Tortured Path can be an inconsistent, luck-based mess. A lot like Outbreak, it's a really cool experiment, but an experiment like this should have been a bonus mode given to players for purchasing DLC 3, and not the pack's main content. A lot like how Turned and Grief were automatically offered to players who purchased their specific respective DLCs. To give the game credit though, unlike Outbreak and the recent Duran Fong, Sledgehammer actually released each map as its own survival map, something other games can't say that they've done. The Tortured Path, while fun, is an extremely flawed and cumbersome mess and feels more like a first draft idea that needed a few more runs in the development cycle. So from the tortured path, let's move on to the game's finale, The Frozen Dawn. And thus we've arrived at the end of our World War II Zombies experience with The Frozen Dawn, World War II Zombies Grand Finale. Starting off with the story, our map begins with a conversation between Hank Rideau and BAT agent Vivian Harris, a character originally in the campaign. After the events of the Tortured Path and assembling the Sword of Barbarossa, our heroes go missing in a plane crash trying to escape New Swabia. Now with an unending horde of the undead at their doorstep, Rideau plans to extract the sword from the wreckage and use its power to finally end the undead advance. The cutscene ends with a panzer mortar destroying an aircraft carrier as the horde overruns those left alive on the nearby ship. Even though it's never shown, our heroes crash landed and happen to stumble upon the entrance to Thule, the ancient society where Geistcraft originated. A weird nitpick I have is that in the Tortured Path's outro cutscene, our characters very clearly board a small airplane when leaving the temple. Why didn't they take the pieces of the sword with them when they arrived? Why perform all this caravan garbage in DLC 3 if all of it could have been avoided by simply flying with the pieces? But who knows, maybe it wasn't possible to fly under the harsh winter conditions, but it looks pretty sunny in the outro cutscene. Why not fly to the temple then? And not only that, it's pretty clearly implied our tiny little biplane crashed in the same area the Zeppelin crashed. Why is there this much wreckage? And how come our characters didn't see this wreck either? Weird inconsistencies aside, there's the actual map design. Making up one large circle with three various side pockets, the map geometry actually resembles Darice and Garai Krovi more than any other map. And a lot like Sledgehammer's Carrier and Descent, the player can also hop off the edge on this side of the map and instantly kill themselves if they so desire. No guard railings here, I'll tell you that. The map also introduces our final new foe, Thule's Corpse Eater. Powering themselves up by consuming the undead, the Corpse Eater, at full power, can outsprint players similar to Sizzlers and output damage like a Moichler. Man, Sledgehammer really only ever has one idea when coming up with new enemies. Their numbers are extremely niche, and only ever show up for mainly easter egg steps and the player waits around long enough during the round. To activate Pack a Punch, players must press this button found in the archives and travel using the three teleporters around the map, each one slowly bringing up the machine. Apparently, the teleporters in the map rip your body apart and reassemble it in a matter of seconds. Is it unique? Yes. Is it totally edgy and tone deaf? Also yes. And finally, there's the map's wonder weapons. Very similar to the mythology of the origin staffs, the raven weapons were the artifacts held by the original raven lords when they initially defeated the god king, the game's true antagonist. 
So let's talk about them, shall we? There's the Death Raven's Thulian Scythe, an extremely unique melee weapon that, when upgraded, can produce powerful long-range shockwaves, and if players kill a Corpse Eater, they'll be able to cheat death, and the next fatal blow they take will not harm them. It's easily one of the map's best. It's the easiest to access, upgrade, and use. It's basically this map's version of the Lightning Bow or the Hand of Sharon. To unlock the weapon, players simply have to survive a small trial in the Forge Room, and to upgrade the weapon, players have to harvest a spine from a Corpse Eater and fill it up with Geistcraft. Once it's been charged and left to settle, taking it into a teleporter will allow players to arrive at the Death Raven Trial. Before the trials of the upgraded Gauntlets in Ancient Evil, the Frozen Dawn did this idea first. Players are given the chance to see the Wonder Weapon's unique abilities, and how they'll interact with the player during the boss fight. These boss scenarios are only needed though if players plan to actually complete the Easter Egg. Once upgraded, the player is returned to the battlefield. Next up is the Blood Raven's Thulean Shield. Requiring players to fill up three blood pools, players must then arrive in the Blood Altar and defeat a Whistling carrying the shield. The Thulean Shield can protect players from oncoming attacks, initiate a bayonet charge, and can produce a powerful shockwave as an attack. Once claimed, players must kill a charged corpse eater atop the filled blood pools. When correctly killed, symbols will become imprinted in the blood. Once three symbols have been claimed, players must collect a radio and input the symbols by killing zombies when the correct symbol is shown. Once you've inputted all three symbols, you must now down yourself in the blood to initiate the Blood Raven Trial. With the upgraded shield, the shockwave attack increases in damage. The shield can take more hits, and if the player fills up the map's various altar stones and initiates the action button within the stone, the area becomes surrounded in a blinding light, and any enemy inside the circle can become quickly obliterated. The shield is a lot of fun to use, and it's my personal favorite for its utility and effective damage. Although, the upgrade process can be quite lengthy, and the hitboxes for killing the charged corpse eaters can be rather glitchy. Like, this kill right here didn't count. How? Thanks, World War II. Up next is the Storm Raven's Thulean Hammer. Honestly, this upgrade has a billion steps, so just kind of stick with me, okay? I'm gonna gloss over some stuff. Producing a high output of damage, the hammer is great at taking out foes, even unupgraded. But upgrading the weapon is rather troublesome. So first of all, to collect the weapon, having to collect and move a battery from spawn, players must fill up the charge, and then go around the map and gather four stones. Once you get kills by the corresponding stones, the game will summon in the hammer. Sadly, the hammer will continue to teleport away and escape the player. Players must now align the four electrical statues around the arena, and then chase the hammer back into the middle. To upgrade the weapon, players must grab this electrical charge from spawn and guide it throughout the map. Once you've reached the altar room, the player must kill a zombie under this overpass, and finally, perform a quick weapon glitch and power the contraption. And now let me say, getting a kill under this underpass can be hard, but once done, you'll breathe a sigh of relief. Now, to complete the contraption puzzle, just use a guide. Ignoring the first puzzle, the second and third set have the same variation, so just use a guide and it'll help you complete the step. And finally, to access the trial, head over to the hammer overpass and perform a trust walk. A hidden pathway will become available, and once at the end, you'll be raised into the trial. Be wary though, the undead can follow you on this invisible pathway, because apparently they're worthy of the hammer too. In the trial, players must destroy the purple auras to escape. Now upgraded, the Thulean Hammer can be thrown and retrieved like Mjolnir. Another added ability is the Electric Burst. This ability is quite similar to the shield's basic attack, or another better example is the sword's ability from the Shadow Throne. Sadly, I'm not that much of a fan of the hammer either. It can be quite sluggish, and when thrown, it can take quite a while for the hammer to return. You're also left vulnerable, and throwing the hammer isn't really as effective as you might think it'd be. Rather play over Mob the Dead Origins? Um, yeah, Chris mm. would play Die Rise over those maps. God, I would. I like Die Rise. I could never do that. Over Mob? Why? And finally, there's the Moon Raven's Thulean Flail. Oh boy. Now to obtain this flail, prepare to throw logic completely out of the window. Players must scavenge the map and collect two books and three cogs. Once you reveal the cipher and power the observatory, it's time to actually understand the puzzle. Basically, take a photo of this puzzle, flip it vertically, and then you must base your orbs by using this corner as 12 o'clock. Basically, assume there are 12 different spots to stop the orbs, with each of the 12 spots corresponding to an hour on the clock. It's not too specific, thankfully. 
So for example, because the orbs move counterclockwise, the red orb must be stopped at 5 o'clock, the yellow at 7 o'clock, green at 11, and the purple orb at 3. The game will make a sound effect when an orb has been correctly stopped too. I hope I described it well, because trying to figure this out on my own was pretty difficult. And once you've revealed the flail, you can throw an orb using the left bumper and teleport with the same button. The flail itself can also be used like the dancer's dagger, with quick executions and all. To upgrade the flail, players simply have to kill three zombies on one of the movement raven panels hiding above the arena. And by holding left trigger, players can go into a flail vision. While in this vision, players must search for constellations. By connecting the dots, players will have viewed one of the constellations. Repeat this process with the other two Moonraven stones, and finally, once done, you can throw your orb into the planetarium and access the flail trial. Inside the trial, players must kill zombies and use the teleportation of the restored flail to avoid the wrath of the sun. I have not yet survived this trial without going down at least once. I hate this event so much. Once you're released, you'll have gained the upgraded flail. Coming with new abilities, players can teleport a lot quicker, you can control zombies with the flail's orb, much like the turned ability, and when performing a quick execution, even regain armor pieces just like the dancer's dagger. The flail offers a ton of utility, but it is the weakest overall in terms of firepower. The reason I wanted to go over the wonder weapons in such an in-depth manner is because the map revolves so much around their inclusion. It's a very similar issue I have with Ancient Evil and Origins. These maps are built heavily around their wonder weapons, and their inclusions in the Frozen Dawn is the biggest offender. Without them, the map only has its aesthetics to go off of, offering nearly nothing in terms of unique gameplay or memorable moments. If you aren't building the wonder weapon, the entire map can feel very forgettable. And fun fact, now that we've gone over and built all four wonder weapons, we've already completed the entire easter egg. So now, let's go over the god king and his corresponding boss fight, shall we? The original ruler of Thule, the god king is an ancient force originally sealed away by the first raven lords. When King Barbarossa failed to conquer Europe during the Second Crusade, his ship had run aground in Antarctica, where he encountered Geistcraft and the God King's power. Using a Thulean sword and the Geistcraft energy to fuel his army, he united Europe under the Holy Roman Empire, and under the influence of the God King, planned to take over the whole world. But he was defeated once more by his own guards, apparently by the Germanic goddess Nerthus. The God King tried to arise once more using Dr. Straub as his new host. But with his plans foiled by Marie and her team, he had to find a new way to take over the world. As Rodeau attempts to extract the sword and our crew, Vivian comes across the weapon, and under the influence of the God King, now attempts to revive him where he'll unleash the ultimate calamity. Being tasked with stopping Vivian, our crew activates the God King Citadel and takes the elevator down. Hey look, the weapons all make a hilt, that's funny. And when arriving at the Citadel, our crew is too late as Vivian revives the God King, thrusting the sword deep into his chest fully restoring his body. With this, the conclusive battle begins. Or we can just do this. God, I love World War II. What a fun boss fight. Alright, alright, I'll discuss the actual boss fight. In the first phase, players must avoid the Geistcraft Blast and Geistcraft Bomb Showers. This can take quite a while, but once enough damage has been dealt, the God King will begin to siphon energy from the three Ultra Tablets. Destroying the Tablets, the God King will become stunned, and once damaged, the phase will end. Players will be granted max ammos and full powers. During Phase 2, the God King will continue to barrage players with Geistcraft Blast and will use a blinding light to kill them. But as long as players hide behind these ice pillars or use the shield, they'll be safe from all harm. During Phase 3, he will now attack players from the arena's four corners and grant enemies a Geist Aura. With this ability, they can only be broken by using the Thulean Hammer. And finally, during Phase 4, the game will begin to spawn in Corpse Eaters. When the God King returns to his throne, he will begin to let out a fiery blast. Any player hit will die instantly, 
The player with the flail must teleport through the sun's wrath and melee the god king to prevent any further terror. But once enough damage has been dealt, the god king will pull players towards him, initiating the outro sequence. In co-op, a fifth phase was added that combines all the previous phases together in one final gambit. Once defeated, the outro sequence begins. Now the Rook, the person responsible for picking the new Raven Lords, Klaus Fischer from the Final Reich, chooses Marie and our heroes to take up the mantle and put the God King down once again. Now empowered with the power of the Raven Lords, my channel comes full circle and Raven Toffin is born. As the God King attempts to kill us in one final move, our characters, now with the full power of the Raven Lords, can put him down once again. Thus continuing the cycle of life and death. Much like another zombie storyline, like... With the power of the Ravens, we've reached the epilogue. Our characters learn from Rideau that they've been chosen as the Raven Lords, figureheads throughout history that must put the balance of the world in order, and prevent calamity set in place by the energy of Geistcraft and those who wish to harness it. Rideau urges our characters to return above ground, where they can begin the next step of their adventure. And that's the Frozen Dawn's Easter Egg and subsequent boss fight. I liked upgrading the wonder weapons, but the boss fight is one of my least favorite aspects of the map. It can feel like the fight drags on, and especially in solo, the god king's basic attack can wipe out your armor quite often. And because other than the dancer's dagger, armor is not a replenishable resource, and he just has so much health. But because he has no health phase triggers, cheesing him with frontline and the Thulean scythe is 10 times easier and 10 times more effective. But you do actually get a reward for completing the easter egg. With the Raven Lord's power, the player can now regenerate armor for the rest of the game, and can traverse between the God King Citadel and the main map whenever they please. Speaking of the Citadel, let's talk about that arena, shall we? A lot like my issues with the Altar of Bloods arena, the Citadel can feel childish and overblown, especially with all the blood fountains and blood waterfalls everywhere. Seriously, there's no realistic way this much blood could have been collected. It's almost comical how much of the arena it fills up and it makes it extremely difficult to take the God King seriously. Speaking of the God King, fun fact, he carries the heads of Frederick Barbarossa and Peter Straub on his waist, almost like how Straub wore Richter's head as a trophy in subsequent maps. And that's the Frozen Dawn. A lot like my thoughts on Beast from Beyond, it's quite clear the developers are running low on time, and the map can feel pretty bare bones. And for the game's final map, it offers very little in terms of a memorable experience, and aside from the map's unique wonder weapons, the overall experience is pretty forgettable, and the destination of Thule feels more like an afterthought, as very little of their society is expressed, and the map is more or less a glorified wonder weapon simulator. And of course, there's the game's cliffhanger ending, but what can I say that I haven't said before? So what else does the game have to offer? Well, let's find out. I am sorry about Agent Harris, I know what you and your team have been through, all that you know. So what do players get for beating every single easter egg then? Well, after completing the final main quest, players are granted the Witch Warden character skin and the Uber Schnell weapon charm, which can be attached to any weapon besides pistols and melee weapons. I really like these rewards a lot. Players already have the ability to pick a different starting weapon as they please, so the RK5 approach from Black Ops 3 Revelations wouldn't work all that well. And if you know my thoughts on Director's Cut from IW, then you know I don't like the mode because it pretty much disables all the difficulty of zombies. The weapon charm and character skins are rewards I personally enjoy because they don't give players an unfair advantage, but offer just that little bit of flair that those who have them can show them off to their friends and they're an added benefit to completing the experiences that World War II has to offer. Honestly, the closest example I can give is like the John Wick skin from Fortnite. I know it's a silly comparison, but when it came out, it usually meant that you were dealing with someone who grinded the game and honed their skills, or someone who stole their mom's credit card. Regardless, sometimes a reward doesn't have to be this grandiose gesture. To me, playing zombies is a reward in itself. But the analytical side in me understands that all of these hours of work does not fairly equal a character skin and a weapon charm. And another really cool addition is the challenge board. As players complete easter eggs and various experiences, players will unlock hidden challenges. 
As you complete these challenges, you'll be granted specific character outfits and skins. These challenges can range from completing an easter egg without perks, defeating a treasure zombie, building the Sword of Barbarossa in just 15 minutes and beneath the ice, viewing all the constellations in the Frozen Dawn in just under 3 minutes, defeating the Brenner in on round 50 in Grosten House, defeating the Stad Jaeger in just 33 minutes in the Shadowed Throne, and reaching Prestige Master level 1000, and so on. There are so many different challenges that offer so much variety and varying levels of difficulty. This is something I begged Exozombies to do with the trophy system, and it's amazing to see here. While some challenges are harder than others, the added benefit of these gives the game so much more replayability, and I don't think I ever want to stop praising Sledgehammer for this feature. And then there's even more little rewards and oddities. By completing the Tortured Path's easter eggs in the Darkened Path mode, players will unlock a really cool weapon charm. Again, I know it doesn't sound like an insane reward, but compared to Treyarch who have given us literally... It's a step in the right direction, and surprisingly the bare minimum is miles better than what the other two studios have attempted. Other rewards include the Thulean Weapon Camo. By inputting 3939 into the radio in the Shadow Throne, players will be given a Weapon Camo. And, as stated earlier, Completing a chapter of the Tortured Path's Easter Egg also gives you weapon camo. World War II Zombies gives players a reason to keep coming back to their quest lines and rewards them for their hard work and skilled play. But with all that said, let's get into the conclusion. World War II Zombies is easily the series' most divisive entry. From terrible mechanics and balancing issues, and a tonal shift that makes the game go from epic and grandiose, to one of the series' most laughable and tone deaf. But on the upside, the game offers an amazing atmosphere, quest design, and attention to player choice and longevity. World War II Zombies is one of the hardest games I've ever had to review simply because I can't tell you if I actually love the game or not. I did not like Advanced Warfare's Exo Zombies, and I loathe Infinite Warfare's IW Zombies. But in World War II Zombies, it truly felt like the team at Sledgehammer had learned from their mistakes and made a mode that felt truly special. One that captured my heart and reminded me of the special memories I had trying to play Zombies as a kid. But even with some aggravating mechanics, I must conclude that what makes World War II Zombies work makes the game truly special. But the mechanics that hurt the game truly bring down the experience and drag it to some of its lowest lows. With all that said though, I still can't recommend this game enough to any hardcore Zombies fan. While it indeed has its flaws and shortcomings, it's clear to see the passion and love that went into making this game a one-of-a-kind experience, and has changed the way I view the entire game mode forever. Who knows what I'll cover next, but now with this experience under my belt, it feels like I've finally come full circle in my quest to fully appreciate the game mode that I love and cherish so much. Thank you all for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to like and subscribe. I had an absolute blast making this behemoth of a project. This endeavor has basically consumed my life since the beginning of August when I finished the Exozombies review. If you made it this far, I can't thank you enough. Your support is what makes content creating so special. Well, until next time, thank you for watching. And remember, keep on slaying.